Jane, if you will, please. Sure. I recommend that minutes pertaining to litigation legal update um, the Met, Dinsmore, Lucy, Kendall, and Warwick versus Charaho, um, Prince ML, remain sealed. So moved. So moved. Got it. So, motion made by Catherine just right before Donna and seconded by. Uh, Mr. Luzon. Uh, any discussion? All right. Those in favor? All right. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? I abstain. Thank you. Any recusals? Okay. So we have one abstention. It's Mr. Luzon. I believe we have a full contingent except as Lisa. Did Lisa get on? I haven't seen her online yet. Okay, so we have everybody but Lisa. Okay. Next, disclosure of executive session votes. There were four. Uh, the first one was the approval of executive session minutes of May 26. It was unanimous. Uh, those in favor, uh, George Abbott. Linda McAllister, Linda Lyle, Catherine Juicy, Lisa Macaruso, Ryan Callahan, Murat Dimov, Clay Johnson, Bill Day, and David Stahl. Uh, the second vote was executive session minutes, um, also of May 26. Again, it, there was 10 votes. Uh, they were, it was unanimous in favor. Uh, those voting were George Abbott, Linda McAllister, Linda Lyle, Catherine Juicy, Lisa Macaruso, Ryan Callahan, Murat Dimov, Clay Johnson, Bill Day, and David Stahl. The third vote was, um, again, uh, executive session minutes for May 26th. It was, again, 10 votes, all unanimous. Those voting were George Abbott, and those voting in favor. George Abbott, Linda McAllister, Linda Lyle, Catherine Juicy, Lisa Macaruso, Ryan Callahan, Murat DeMaul, Clay Johnson, Bill Day, and David Stahl. The fourth and final vote was to return to open session. It was unanimous, but there was 11 votes this time. Those voting were George Abbott, uh, Linda McAllister, Linda Lyle, Catherine Juicy, Lisa Macaruso, Ryan Callahan, Marat Dimov, Clay Johnson, Bill Day, David Stahl, Hank Craig was on, all in favor. Thank you. Recognition. Ryan. Ryan. Yep. I was on uh, telephone and I voted. I couldn't get okay. into the meeting, so I, I called in. And you probably didn't hear me because I probably was on mute, but I did vote. I thought I Okay. Did. All right. Okay. All right. We'll adjust that then. That was. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, recognition. All right. Please join me in congratulating the following. We have Reese Hathaway. She was selected to the Rhode Island All-State Band and Southern New England Honor Band. Austin Thorpe, selected to Rhode Island All-State Band. And Matthew Massey, selected to the Southern New England Honor Band. Also, we have a grade eight student, Rachel Williams, who are in the first chair position, clarinet, in the All-State Orchestra. For the Rhode Island FFA Association, the annual state convention winners. For Employment Skills Leadership Development event, we have Ella Krause in first place and Dalton Stone in second place. For our Agriculture Skills Demonstration event, Jessica Shalou in second place and Layla Berry in third place. Agriculture Illustrated Talk event, Maya Fredette in second place. Floriculture Team Career Development event, Triana Burdick, Olivia Ferraza, Maya Fredette, and Jessica Shalou are the second place team. And Jessica Shalou earned second place individual. For May, um, our employees of the month for the high school are the high school guidance counselor, Patty Dipolino, and early childhood educator, Michelle Merlino. For June, employees of the month, we have middle school dean, guidance counselor, Gianni Pederuti, and high school guidance counselor, Karen Fonts. 
And then we just want to recognize this evening our 2019-2020 retirees. For our certified staff, we have Kelly Gordon, Cynthia Potter, Holly Manchester, Pamela McKean, Nikki Scott, Robert Tambo, Sal Jerry, Lynn Larned, and Jeannie Gott. For support staff, we have Gloria Petey, Douglas Barker, and Lynn Roberts. And for administrators, Doug, Douglas Lander and Susan Rogers at the end of the month. Awesome. Uh, Bill, I see your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge a couple things that happened uh, back on uh, June 8th. <clears throat> uh, I was at the Richmond Town Hall for the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, rally uh, as a member of the Richmond EMA, one of my little part-time jobs. And I was so very impressed with the organization of this uh, group of young students here at Charaho. They had masks for everyone who didn't need have one. Uh, they had water. Uh, I did not see one one face over there uncovered, and uh, they just did a, a fantastic job. And we should be very very proud of the students. I I I know that they put a lot of work into it, and they had like two hundred and. 50 or so, I guess, at the, at the peak of the, of the time when I left there to go to the graduation parade, there was still well over 100 people lining 138 uh, with their signs and their uh, placards. And the second thing is, uh, I obviously was there along with the majority of the school committee members at the uh, graduation parade, and I thought that was very well put together by the administration, the staff, and it was well uh from what we from what we could see in, in my uh, advantage point the students were very uh, appreciative and uh did not get out of hand in any any way probably probably less rowdy than some of the uh, graduations of the uri as far as uh participation by the uh graduates so uh, i just thought that they both needed to uh have a little uh, shout out and a job well done thanks bill well said um, you know, in that same um, vein, I'd like to, I know Mario Andre, I think this might be your last school committee meeting with us. I just want to uh, take this moment to, to recognize you and say thank you uh, for coming on board and helping us in our time of need. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and just, you know, uh, the school committee wishes you the, the best of luck and, and just wants to extend our, our most uh, heartfelt thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This brings us to public forum. Okay, everybody, I think um, most everybody knows how to do this, but at the bottom of your screen, there's a participants icon. If you click on that, the list will pop up on the left-hand side. At the bottom of that list, there's a little hand icon. If you wish to be recognized, please raise the, uh, the hand by clicking on it. It'll pop up on my screen, um, and then I'll call on you in order. Uh, school committee members will get prioritized, but uh, we'll try and get through um, uh, everybody uh, as expediently as possible. Um, I can't see a lot of hands. I can only put X number of um, screens up at one time. So uh, just make sure that you raise your hand or if you, you can't, that uh, you audibleize the, the need to, to be recognized. With that being said, it is now public forum. I invite any members of the public who have comments for the school committee um, on any topics that are not listed on our agenda for this evening. All right, thank you. On to policy. All right, before you this evening, you have the academic requirements for high school graduation revision. I recommend approval of the revised policy. So moved. Second.
Ryan, we can't hear you. Right. Sorry. I'm unmuted now. Uh, we have a motion and a second uh, to approve the revised policy. This is open for discussion. If there's no discussion, we'll move it to vote. Those in favor of the re revised policy? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Any recusals? Oh, thank you. It's unanimous. All right, this brings us to business. Um, and I take great pleasure in this one. I recommend the approval of Jane Daly's contract effective July, 20, uh, July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. Jane's so current contract expires June 30th, 2021. So moved. Second. Thank you. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Right. Opposed? Abstentions? Recusals? Thank you, it's unanimous. I recommend the approval. Mr. Chair, can brings I just us to ask business. one question? Yes, sir. I Mr. didn't Chair, I'm so, see I'm your hand if you that. did that before. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm sorry about that. Just, I, I was voting in favor of that anyway, um, but just I, as the sort of the newer guy here, timing on these, um, how does that work? Um, I, I understand her contract is a, is through 2021. Um, I just want I'm just trying to figure out how, and as we vote on the next one as well, um, how the timing of that works. When do we vote on a contract that's expiring? What are, are there? Is that separate or different for each contract? Is that the same across all administrators? Just asking a question for my clarification. Yeah, these these two contracts are structured uh, somewhat evergreen, so the year before they go into their final year, they're voted on again for a one year extension. So the initial contract is a two year and then with a rolling one year extension um, a year out from, from expiration. I believe that this is unique for these positions, but I don't know, Jane or Sue, is, is that correct? Yes, I mean, um, it, yes. And I think John Anderson is on the call also. Um, if you'd like him to, if you have any specific questions for him. Yeah, no, I, I think that answers the question uh, oh. for me. I appreciate that, Ryan. I was just trying to figure out when I, I, know, I thought we yeah. were doing two years and then I was trying to figure out the one year renewal and the timing of it and all that sort of thing. So fully uh, on board here and in agreement with all, just trying to clarify the timing for me. So I understood what we were doing. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Thank you, Jane. All right, this, this brings us to um, business letter B. Uh, I recommend the approval of Gina Picard's contract effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2022. So moved. Second. Hmm. Motion and a second to approve Gina Picard's contract. Discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Recusals? No, it's unanimous. Thank you. Let her see, Jane. Okay. Make sure I'm not on mute. All right, so school improvement teams update. Um, as requested, Richmond School has revised the composition of their school improvement team. I recommend approval of the Richmond School Improvement Team membership. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the Richmond School uh, Improvement Team. This is open for discussion. No discussion. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed? I hear no opposed. Uh, uh, any abstentions? Recusals? No, it's unanimous. Thank you. All right, next, um, item D, the Champlin Grant, uh, creating a middle school mindfulness center. This item was requested by several committee members at the last meeting, and Katie Karakosian is available to address any questions or concerns. Great, thank you. I'm opening this for discussion. Uh, we've already voted on this and approved it, um, so the, the floor is open for discussion for those who had, had questions on it. Cool. David Stahl. Chair, the, the uh, links I was asking about um, last time, the link for the library and the, the mindfulness program series, um, it, in my packet documents, I tried clicking on the links, I tried copying the links and putting them in the browser, still not working. Um, so I still have not been able to read any of that information that I was curious about. Um, so I'm interested in the, in the curriculum itself um, and uh, um, the library and the, the program series, what's involved in all that. And I, I'm still unable to get into that. So I don't know if, if um, I noticed uh, uh, it was just shared here with us again. I can try that link. Um, and maybe we need to just print the material if we can't figure out a way to get the links to work or, or put it in PDFs or something. Uh, yeah, agreed. Um, uh, I'm open to suggestions from the administration on the best and most effective way to get this, um, the curriculum information to the committee. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, we, we put out the full address. Um, I guess in the future, if we're not able to get the packet electronically to you so that the links are live, then you're right. We'll have to um, print out the attachment so that way we'll be able to just print the whole thing out for you. So we'll, we'll work on the electronic part first, but if that doesn't work. But I do think Katie is on the call and could answer yes. questions about some of those things if you'd like. Just yes, to help so explain it better. Yes, I am, I am here and available to answer questions. My apologies for any links that were not working. Um, they had been triple checked. So it may be uh, just a, a Google mystery um, on my part why there were any errors um, with access. I have shared the links in the chat um, currently and I'm happy to address any questions you may have. Our chair. Yeah, Craig. Uh, I had a hard time getting into, into an executive session, but it kept, kept telling me on my computer I should I should be upgrading it, the operating system. And I don't know if that was affecting David. Uh, so I'm just throwing that out there. So, I mean, I've never seen this before till tonight. So. Okay, so you did share the links in chat, Katie? Yes, I did. I see it. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes, sir. Um, the, the links in, from the chat are working just fine right now. Um, I'm able to click through those and, and uh, see those. Um, so uh, I'm, just not, I'm just not positive if I'll be able to after our Zoom meeting when I have more time to uh, read them because they weren't working in the, uh, in the packet documents. But I will try to copy these links and hang on to them so that I can use them um, afterwards but I, my my whole uh, question on this is is i just saw very quickly in the second link the the teacher portion of this so uh, maybe um um katie could speak to that um just uh, because i haven't had time to read it yet so uh, who's who's teaching and <clears throat> what is she teaching and how is she teaching where does she come from uh what are the what's the what's the background what's the approach the credentials etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. absolutely um so in the um, proposal that was submitted um by by erin wu she has um a master's in education and she's the assistant director of the mindfulness um, in education program at brown university 
um, in conversations and how this kind of grew out of a discussion with um, middle school um, teachers and administrators, I began doing research on mindfulness and realized that we were fortunate enough, um, unbeknownst to me before this process, we were fortunate enough to have um, some experts um, at Brown, so locally, um, in reaching out to them and seeing some of the uh, workshops that they offered for teachers to help them bring in mindfulness practices um, to better inform uh, their, their um, approach and their abilities to um, connect and communicate with students. Um, I spoke with them about some of their uh, workshops that they offered. And in speaking with Erin, she discussed um, some possibilities. So she uh, sent me this proposal where um, teachers, I'm just flipping now so I can get the number of hours, etc. cetera. Um, in one of the series, for the mindfulness program that's proposed at the middle school once the space is created. Um, the proposal is to um, offer a mindful teacher, mindful student course, which would be 12 hours. Teachers would be able, um, since we're unsure how, uh, what number of teachers may be interested in participating, um, we are proposing that this 12 hour course be offered to all teachers and a certain number up to, I believe she said, 30 or 35 becomes a comfortable number, would be able to um, take this 12-hour this course where teachers would be able to uh, practice and learn various techniques such as um, the neuroscience behind mindfulness, breathing techniques um, that will help inform um, their, their practice in the classroom. Um, so it's through that that 12 hour course that uh, she has designed and taught as I've been told many times before with teachers across the state and uh, many take this this series across the country as well. Um, she proposes to to offer this to our middle school faculty. Thank you, Katie. Further questions on that, David, I see Murat also has a question. I'll defer to Murat first. Murat, the floor chair, sir. And then, yeah. and then Bill. Um, so, so I know I did ask, uh, the link's weren't wrong because I did ask Katie uh, the, this afternoon, I believe, when she did send me the, uh, the walking link. Um, but I also, same way as David, David uh, I was not, able to go to the list and um, look at them before we had to go to the uh, school committee. So I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready to vote on this consciously. I think there is a benefit in program like this, but I really want to understand what is the content of those books. And uh, for that, I just simply need time. Um, it is unfortunate that then PDF document, the links look correct, but when I was copying them out, they were just all mangled. And um, despite my attempts to make them work, they just weren't working. So maybe there, maybe there is a lesson for us for future sharing of the uh, internet links to the PDFs because they don't seem to work. Um, so I'm not sure how to vote today about it, but uh, um, I would probably ask that we push this to the next committee meeting unless this is urgent and time pressing as far as any deadlines or anything like that. Yeah, so the committee's already um, voted on this. Oh, uh, this is discussion. Yeah. And since the two primary, well, the two of the committee members at least want more time to, to delve into this, I, I do recommend that at the end, we just put this on an agenda item for the next meeting as well. So those questions, if any, come up, can be addressed. Yeah, that would work. Thank you. Um, I've got Bill Day and then George Abbott. Uh, yes, I, uh, I noticed where uh, proposed mindfulness center space in Art Room 3. So the principal of the middle school and superintendent are comfortable with taking a art room out of the middle school and using it for or something that may or may not be beneficial to our students. Because I, I, I know that we've been pushing art 
in the district, we have some very talented young artists and uh, we go to Odyssey and we see all of the things that they, they develop. And I'm just curious as to why we're decided to uh, take an art room out, out, of, out of the curriculum over there and, uh, and come in with something that uh, really is un unproven. That's my question, I guess. My, not I guess, I know it's my question. I'll leave that open to uh, the administration and staff if they have an answer to that. Uh, so, so I will say that I have worked um, directly uh, with the principal and assistant principal on this project um, and administrators as well. Um, this is a, currently not being used as an, as an art room. It, it is a, as you see from the um, images in the document, it's a, it's a flexible space at the moment. Um, for Champlin, we're trying to think creatively and broadly about ways of making an impact for our students. Uh, first and foremost, I agree that art is, is incredibly uh, beneficial to students, but through some of the research that I've been doing, I think mindfulness can also make an impact. It's a flexible enough space where I think if art was needed in that space, um, we would be able to, to utilize it as such but it's flexible enough as well that students would be able to utilize it in creative ways throughout the day with their teachers, even after school with advisor support. Um, and I think really serves a niche or a need that's been communicated to me, which is why I began this journey um, for the middle school to research more on mindfulness. I'll, I'll share, and I, and I have no stock in this book, um, but I just wanted to, address the point about um, unproven. Um, this is evidence informed. Um, and, and just by happenstance, I was listening to NPR as I was writing this and, you know, kind of diving deeply into this idea of mindfulness and trying to think of how um, it could benefit our students. And uh, I heard this, this gentleman, this author talking about a book called Breathe. Um, so I've been reading it by James Nestor, and it's the new science of a lost art. I'm hoping that I can benefit from it. And breathing is one of the central tenets of mindfulness and teaching students how to um, breathe in, that's just, again, one, one example, but how to breathe in critical ways to help reduce stress, to help focus on the present moment, um, and learn strategies um, for dealing with really complex situations that we know that they're dealing with in these um, you know, years of their life. So um, I'm reading more about this. It's talking about research through MIT and Stanford and Harvard. And as I mentioned, it's evidence-informed uh, research. It's really fascinating stuff. And um, I, I hope others might consider reading the book with me. Um, but I'm, I'm reading it and breathing at the same time and trying to think of how this would benefit our students in ways that they can then take, right? We all carry our lungs with us. And we can deal with stressful and um, complex and unexpected situations just through harnessing elements of our own body that we don't think of in, in ways of, of helping us cope with situations. So um, I think mindfulness will benefit our students, will benefit our teachers. In that proposal, there's also an, an, uh, an element for us to offer some, some short parent workshops so they can incorporate this with their students and children at home. Um, so uh, I, I'm very excited for this um, as, a, as a possibility, and I think we have a very strong chance of uh, successfully being funded. So thank you. Thanks, Katie. Uh, I have George, then Donna, then Catherine. George? It sounds to me like it's a form of biofeedback. Um, would you agree with that, Katie? Um, I would. And... Although I'm, I'm, I'm not quite through, I'm about halfway through, um, it's talking about ways to um, deeply connect with normal elements we'd think, we wouldn't think about our bodies doing, um, such as, um, you know, nose breathing versus mouth breathing and how that can have an incredible impact on our bodies. Mouth breathers tend to snore, which those folks don't get the best sleep. We can teach our students how to do some of these things. Um, and as I mentioned, even decrease blood pressure. Some of these studies have been researching that. So I agree with you about this bio, biofeedback element 
and um, think it could really lead to some, some critical teachings that we might not have expected our students to learn in their middle school years. I had uh, one other question, or one question. Mm -hmm. um, is there any cost to Charo that won't be covered by the Champlin Grant? Um, excuse me while I just... Um, Fresh my memory with the with the budget. I believe the only thing we were suggesting is um, some painting of the space because some things are being taken down off the walls to give it a, a fresh coat of paint was suggested as an in-kind offering. And one thing that I know that the middle school uh, PTO has has generously offered already, and you see in those images, are the mats that are there um, to make a more kind of cushioned floor. And it was quite a um, large uh, investment on their part. Um, so that's been a uh, some in-kind support for this project and and re reimagining and redeveloping the space overall but otherwise i do not see any any cost associated for the district thank you uh donna yeah katie um thank you for bringing this to light i think it's uh, very very relevant for our our kids and an, at an appropriate age to be aware of this um, they're dealing with the stress. Lord knows what stress is going to come in the next few years. And I think it's extremely relevant and thank you for bringing it out. So I highly endorse it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Catherine. Uh, my sentiments echo Donna's uh, a fair bit. And as the mom of two middle school students, one who's about to graduate, I can tell you this is, beneficial and we practice mindfulness at home it's not as easy a skill as it sounds like it should be and so it's something that does need to be taught um, particularly with this generation of children who are just coming out of a pandemic and distance learning and the challenges associated with that that i don't know that we've seen the full repercussions of of their mental health um, and we've been hearing that from administrators and teachers that we're going to have to be very focused and diligent with that so i think this is a great use of of um, funds if we get them um, and something to even think about if we don't win this grant so i appreciate all the hard work katie thank you David Stahl. So um, I, I, I'm gonna be the guy who says I'm not crazy about this so far. I'm, I'm willing, I'm certainly willing to, to keep talking about it. And, but part, one of the reasons, I, I, obviously I come from a different background in terms of, of uh, you know, the inner self and, and finding peace and, and uh, emotional and, and spiritual well-being and that sort of thing. And that's just the word that I'm throwing in here is spiritual because my, my concern with this is um, the, um, the connection with parts of the mindfulness teaching with certain religions, with Eastern religions and that sort of thing. So we're talking about a lot of different things from breathing to yoga mats or physical exercise or those kind of things, physical things, but there's also the component in there of meditation and um and some of those other mindfulness things and uh, i'm very sensitive uh, i want to be very sensitive um to never be uh, um pushing my own uh, spiritual uh, agendas or values into into the education system i'm also because of that very sensitive about others not being infused there um, so i want us to be very careful about that i want us to make sure that we are and that's why I'm interested in the curriculum. That's why I'm interested in the library and the particular book choices. Because I do, there are ways that this can be done that I would be very comfortable with. There are ways that this can easily slip or cross a line to a place as a board member that I would be really uncomfortable with, as well as as a parent or as a pastor in the community. So that's, that's where I'm coming from on this. I just want to kind of lay that out and be really clear about this. So I, I just want us to be and I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny uh, here. I, I'm try, I want us to be mindful about uh, what we're choosing and why and making sure that we're, we're focusing on behavior and, and peace and good mental, mental wellness without crossing over into a spiritual or, or a place that's, that's teaching or condoning a particular religious belief. Um, because I'm sensitive to that. Uh, it's a conversation, obviously, I've been having for years in, in the public sector where it meets with 
with um, religion and that sort of thing. So I just want us to be careful of that. And that's what I am uh, watching for in the curriculum and the books and that sort of thing. Uh, may I respond? Yes, I'd, please. That'd be great. Um, so I um, agree with you 100%. And my, my focus and my thrust in writing this uh, was to definitely focus on the non-sectarian benefits of mindfulness and to ensure that um, my conversations with with Aaron, for example, and the library that I put together, um, this 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 rogue link is going to keep me up tonight. And how how that happened? So my apologies. But if I could just quickly read the six titles in the library, um, so folks folks can get a sense. I know you'd want to dig deeper, but the first, the Mindful Schools Curriculum for Adolescents: Tools for Developing Awareness. Mindfulness in the Secondary Classroom, a Guide for Teaching Adolescents, and that's an SEL solution series. The Mind Up curriculum, grades six through eight, brain-focused strategies for learning and living. Create a culture of kindness in middle school, 48 character building lessons to foster respect and prevent bullying. That's a free spirit professional um, series. Mindful games, sharing mindful, mindfulness and meditation with children, teens, and families. Mindful Reminder Card Deck, 52 Powerful Practices for Teens and Adults. Um, so I tried to be um, diverse with the library. I included three copies, so uh, teachers would be able to uh, you know, take those and read them and think of ways to incorporate them into their own practice or their own classroom, uh, for example. And I, and I understand your concerns about words such as meditation and yoga um, in trying to find ways to uh, incorporate elements of stretch, which are also important, right, to stretch and to move the body. And this originally started as a kind of movement center. But then as we talked about move, movement and mindfulness, it just kept moving more towards that kind of overall mindfulness and growth mindset uh, framework. But um, Amazon searching, you know, finds you the best price on things. And I try to be hard nosed about that. Uh, finds you the best price on things when you and you have to search things like yoga mats or or what have you. Um, so I understand those terminologies or those words do come in there, but this again very much is focused as a as a non sectarian way for students to um, reflect and uh, focus on the present moment in order to move thoughtfully through their world every day and and harness those tools and just have them as part of a toolkit and not the only thing they go to. Maybe some of the students that experience this mindfulness center, um, it, it, it won't work for them or they, they will like certain things and not others, but it's broadening their horizons and allowing them to experience um, some of the possibilities out there and things as simple as, you know, slowing your breathing, stretching your body and, and that kind of um, uh, connection is uh, something that I don't necessarily think is, is taught and taught consistently perhaps in our curriculum and could be taught in more creative ways. Sorry. I've got um, Bill Day has his hand up and Andrea, you as well? Okay, so Bill and then Andrea Smos. I just wanna say Dave, uh, I support you 100%. Uh, anything that come out of Brown University uh, in the past, dealing with education and stuff like that, I think has been uh, detrimental to uh, good good uh, educational uh, standards in the state of Rhode Island. So uh, uh, Brown University, uh, when she mentioned Brown University, that turned me off, but I also believe that uh, there's a possibility of uh, going in a direction uh, that we shouldn't be going in. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Ms. Foss. I just wanted to share um, a little bit because I'm invested in this as a former school psychologist. This is an important topic. Mental health is a very important topic and I can appreciate everyone's perspective. I just wanted to add on to what Katie was saying in terms of students having tools in their toolkits. I think it's really important that students have access to a variety of tools for what works for them, especially when it comes to their social emotional learning. As we all know, SEL health is very important, especially now, um, no more time than the present. Social emotional learning is really coming to the forefront. Um, and I do um, want, the, want those to know that um, techniques such as breathing techniques, as well as mindfulness have been vetted by research and are considered to be evidence-based practices and can be supported through scientific journals. And just wanted to 
shed some light there as well, something for us to think about. Um, we did have a mental health steering committee a few years ago that proved very successful and we validated a lot of tools and resources, some of those being mindfulness techniques. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, um, anything further to discuss on the Champlin Grant? All right, if not, then let's move on to letter E. All right, the uh, next, I recommend approval to submit the CALA School Improvement Funding Grant in the amount of $95,163 for the 2020-2021 school year. If approved, this will bring the total allocation um, for next school year to $197,004.40. $101,841.40 has already been allocated. And again, Katie Karakosian, uh, Development Officer, will be available to address questions or concerns. So moved. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for approving the Cala School Improvement Funding Grant. This is open for discussion. Linda Lyle, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Just wanted to say publicly, um, I've been on this uh, committee. I've been working with Katie and a number of other people. This is important work because um, Calera is an um, underperforming school. It's one of the only ones in our Terre Haute district. So it's, it's really important work. Um, I want to thank uh, Katie while she's here publicly. She has been amazing. She's keeping us on track. She's, in, she's inclusive. She's thorough. Um, she's thoughtful. She's very detailed oriented. She does great research and she's a great writer and her work is spectacular. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you're all aware, any of you aware that the, the state last year ride, when, they, when the, our, that, the, that, that grant was approved, the, the first one, they were using it as an exemplar because it was so perfect and it was so, so well written and so well thought out. So Katie, thank you for your work. I think this is important work, so support you. Thank you, Linda. Further discussion? Donna Chambers. You're muted. Um, what is the Lion Quest? Is that a curriculum that we're um, investing in? I, I'm not familiar with that. Yes, that's a, a SEL curriculum that was vetted um, by CALA staff and administrators. Um, which uh, was determined from a, from a very long list. We then made a short list, presented that to palace staff to um, consider and to vet, and that was their, their choice. Great, great. And I noticed that you also have built in some PD, PD and mentoring around that particular curriculum, right? Yeah. Yes, so, so CALA staff know how to, um, you know, administer the curriculum and, and you know, understand the full scope. Um, there will be um, time set into their professional development uh, days and times. So they're all, you know, on the same page in terms of, of how that's going to uh, be implemented for the school. Okay, and then I, one more thing, Katie, thank you. Um, I did Google it and I wasn't able to find anything on the curriculum itself can you uh, i'll just contact you tomorrow and, and see if i can get more information on it but thank you for doing this yeah it's good thank you i'd be happy to answer any questions right, about thank it you. yes thank you any further questions and again uh, keep in mind i can't see everybody so make sure you hit the raise hand button I see no further questions or, okay, then the motion's before the committee. We have a motion and a second to approve uh, the submission of the Cal School Improvement Funding Grant. Those in favor? Okay. Thank you. Opposed? Abstaining? Recusals? 
unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. This brings us to letter F, budget updates. All right, first we have the FY20 budget update. Um, so Susan has provided a memo which outlines the FY20 budget information. It includes information on withholding of state aid by the state and funds that are not currently expended but being held. Um, and then she's also going to provide an update on the costs and savings due to the pandemic. So, um, Susan? Okay, I uh, learned on May 28th that the state was freezing the lines regarding transportation categorical aid. This is the aid that uh, Barry and the senators and representatives would fight for along with the school committee each year. So they did it for May. We had less than one day's notice that this was happening. They withheld $152,588 and they most likely will do the exact same thing for June. I did send an email to our representatives and senators and they are working on it, but we don't know that if this will be reinstated. The current fiscal year, uh, we were to receive $1,722,000 in this categorical transportation aid. And so we will be receiving $305,196 less. So one of the things you need to consider is as we go through some of the savings that we have due to COVID, we also have to remember that we have lack of revenue also. Um, so as we had discussed previously, uh, oh, the other part of it is, I'm sorry. They also mentioned CTE categorical aid and the Korean Technical Center has categorical aid for a number of different reasons. The first thing is we receive the aid in the summertime. So we already have the aid for FY20, we're safe. There's no guarantee that we're going to get that aid come this summer for the FY21 year. Going into funds that we have not expended, I have held the um, a total of $1,871,783. And that's made up of transportation, field trips, catering, special education tuitions. And I've taken away that 305,000. So right now net, I'm holding $1,566,000. Does anybody have any questions? Open this up for questions for Sue. Kathy? So, Sue, I think there are going to be a lot of um, unknowns in terms of schools opening back up again in the fall. Um, what is your recommendation that we do with this particular money at this point? Um, I would put this as a committed fund balance item. In July, the school committee normally will vote on funds that have not been expended, but that you want to commit for specific reasons in the upcoming year. And because we have no idea what the state aid is gonna look like for next year, uh, this could help offset that. We also don't know, have any idea what transportation is gonna look like next year or the PE that we were gonna need or additional classroom space. So um, my opinion is to hold it and save it and use it if it's necessary. Thank you. Um, follow up to that. So the line item for the transportation, it's about $1.6 million. Um, one of the things that I've heard is adding more busing so we can keep children further apart on buses. And I know all of this is up in the air, 
Um, but my concern is the cost of adding additional buses or more tiered busing. So if we needed to double our busing, we would in essence, correct me if I'm wrong, please, would be doubling our transportation line item. Does that make sense? Not necessarily. Okay. Uh, if, if you were to go into tiered on the same day, we pay for a bus on a daily rate. So yes, the fuel oil, the fuel cost would increase and um, the hourly wages for the staff would increase. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that the actual cost of the bus would increase. If we had to add additional buses, absolutely. Mm. But the bigger issue is going to be right now, if we stick with what the recommendation is, is that's one person every other seat. That's 13 right. kids per bus. Mm -hmm. We have 30 buses, full size buses on this campus every day, and they range anywhere from 50 to 70 kids a bus. So I remember hearing, I think it was the superintendent of Lincoln that was interviewed on TV. And he said, yeah, I'm gonna start picking kids up at 8.30 in the morning and I'll finish picking them up at 1.30 in the afternoon. There aren't gonna be enough buses or enough staff unless they change what the guidelines are right now. Thank you. Uh, Donna. So as far as busing is concerned, um, I know that we have allowed uh, parents to opt out of using the bus. Have that many parents opted out? And do you project that maybe even more will opt out and drive their children to school instead of putting them on a bus? We have parents register for transportation every year. When it first went in two years ago, we were able to save two buses. I don't see us being able to save any buses because of the size of the district. All you need is one child at the furthest point in Charlestown or the furthest point in Hopkinton or Richmond, and that bus has to go up there. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. The size of our district really, we see it in, especially in our elementary runs. Um, so I, I don't see us being able to cut any additional buses. Um, and we have sent out the registration. I don't know how those registrations are currently coming in at the moment. Um, I could probably get some information so you would have it for the July meeting. Okay, that would be good. That would be good. It would be helpful. Thank you. Further questions for Sue? I see none. This brings us to F2. So for FY21 budget, um, an update on the FY21 budget adjustments is included on the um, other side of the memo from Susan dated June 9, 2020. 2020. Um, Sue will be present to answer questions or address concerns. Uh, so what I've done on this particular page is I've recreated what the school committee voted on back in March. What you adopted for the budget back in March, that's the adoption language under number one. I also showed you the comparison between the current budget and what you adopted back in March with the overall 1.95% increase. I also showed you what I have budgeted for state aid. Um, you'd notice under the general aid, I didn't budget anything this year for FY21 because that is the aid that was slowly decreasing over a number of years. And FY20 is the last year we'll receive that. So we aren't expected to get any next year. But what I did want to bring to your attention is I budgeted $1,795,000 in transportation categorical aid. That's the aid they're currently holding from us. So that's a big wild card. Um, and so the total state aid that I budgeted was $2,135,000. Uh, 
what I, um, so the, the net funds that I discussed earlier is that 1.5 million that I'm holding from the FY20. Some of the possible considerations for that would be continuation of distance learning, state aid cuts, additional costs related to COVID. Um, one of the other things we have to consider is legal requirements for student regression during this time and state imposed regulations such as um, distancing in classrooms, transportation requirements, PPE, and also additional custodial staff and supplies. So that's okay. Uh, thank you, Sue. So, George? Yes, uh, Sue, do you expect that we'll know the answers to some of these budgetary questions before the uh, June 30th vote, if there's a vote on June 30th? It depends on how fast the state works. I know that they are discussing the budget right now, um, but I have, I, I don't know. And I think it's all going to depend on if the state were to get additional funds. Um, right now, the governor talks about the, I think it's $42 million that she's distributing amongst the school districts. That's money that we actually found out she was distributing a couple of months ago. And Cheryl Ho's share is around $300,000 of that. So when she spoke of that last week, there were a number of business managers that didn't realize that it was the money she had already told us about. We thought that was a new pot of money. So right now, the only thing that I am aware of that Cheriho could be eligible for is about $300,000 in the CARES Act. So as it stands now, there is a big gap. Correct. Thank you. Other questions for Sue? Okay, thank you. This concludes item number F2. This brings us to F3. Okay, so this is um, adoption of the FY21 budget. So a vote to adopt the budget is needed as the Charaho Act requires the three towns to vote on the school budget within 30 days of adoption by the school committee. And we passed that required timeline for the vote that was taken on March 17, 2020 because of the pandemic. I recommend adoption of the FY 2021 budget in the amount of 64 million two hundred and seventy four thousand nine hundred and one dollars and three cents the total budget including operating capital special revenue enterprise and debt service expenditures but does not include the revenue of nine million forty five thousand thirty dollars and thirty five cents um, with the member towns contribution to be 53,512 I'm sorry 53 million five hundred and twelve thousand nine hundred thirty one dollars and fifty eight cents an increase of one point nine five percent so moved second right. so motion made and seconded this is open for discussion Linda Lyle Thanks. Thanks, Chair. I guess my only question would be, and I, I guess I, I don't know because I don't think I've actually lived through this. If we, I mean, if we adopt this budget, if we vote to adopt this budget, what happens if we do like lose a lot of our state aid? And we have, I guess we can come back and we'd have to amend it or change it or, at, you know, cut it, I guess. Is that what happens? I guess I want to understand that. If we lose our state aid, will be operating under the voter approved budget. For us to get additional funds, we would have to go back to the voters and I'm not sure the mechanism for that outside of our normal budget referendum. So we would be balancing our budget. 
Thank you, Chair. Mr. Abbott? Yes, uh, I'm sorry, but I can't vote in favor of this because of the uh, numerous known unknowns. So I just can't support it. I'll be voting okay. again. Thank you. Further questions? Going once, twice. All right, this motion to approve the fiscal year 2021 budget is now before the committee. Those in favor of approval? All right. Those opposed? I see George. Anyone else? Clay, Clay. Clay? Sorry, Clay, I can't see you. Oh, there you go. George and Clay, anyone else? Any abstentions? Any recusals? Thank you. Motion passes. This brings us to F4. Chair? Um, I believe there was a constituent that had their hand raised. Um, screen name is John Rock. I'm not sure she, she wants to circle back. She's muted. Yeah. Um, um, Set. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. This brings us to F4. All right, I recommend approval to hold the all-day referendum on Tuesday, June 30th, 2020, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in each of the three towns. So moved. Second. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. To approve holding the all-day referendum June 30th. This is open for discussion. Catherine. Thank you. Um, so... From what I understand, the town of Hopkinton is still not going to hold um, another budget referendum on this day, correct? What they're saying. Okay. Um, I want that noted because there was a vote in Hopkinton. Um, unfortunately, the circumstances surrounding it left some voters feeling pretty disenfranchised. Um, if their votes don't count. Um, so I think because there's a lot of public people on this call, um, I would like to hope that those votes end up counting. I know that's not necessarily in our power because we are not the only body that is governed by the Cherokee Act. And I think it's important for people to recognize that we're just one of those bodies that's governed by the Cherokee Act. Um, but if Hopkinton is not going to participate in that all day referendum as per the Cherokee Act, um, I would just like to voice that I'd like the voters who did go out and vote for or against the budget in Hopkinton that those votes are counted. Um, I think voters felt a little bit like they were just kind of caught in between a rock and a hard place. It was very confusing. Um, there was a lot of finger pointing. Um, which doesn't really solve anything at all. And voters don't care to be caught up in that. So I just wanted to, to voice a concern um, and hope that those, vote count, those votes count. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Murat and then Donna. Murat. Good. Um, sorry, um, I thought I was unmuted. So, um, so we got to vote on recommending that the the budget is voted on town. So I'm a little bit confused as to who sets the date. Is that a recommendation to towns, or why? We why the school committee I'm normally sorry. sets the referendum date for the towns. We do it within 30 days of approval of our budget. So Chair who Act requires us to set the date, approve our budget, and get it before the voters within a 30-day window. 
Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Donna Chambers. Yeah, um, Catherine, I totally agree with you that those votes should count. Um, however, I'm going to ask John Anderson to weigh in as far as if it's not a specific referendum, could we on that particular day? Because the Cheriho Act plays a very important role in all of this from a legal perspective. So John, could you please walk us through what will happen if in fact, Hopkinton does not have their own a referendum on that date. As Ryan indicated, the responsibility for determining the date of the referendum, it falls to the school committee. The school committee picks the date. The date has to be within 30 days of approval of the budget. The reason why you're voting, you voted again on the budget tonight was because you voted on back in March, right before the pandemic. And it was not possible to have a referendum within 30 days consistent with the governor's um, restrictions on people coming together. The motion before you is to set a referendum date within 30 days. The date that is set is June 30th. June 30th is the last date that under the Charaho Act that you can set the date. I'm not gonna cross the bridge here tonight um, if um, Hopkinton does not hold a referendum on that day. Your job as a school committee is to follow the Charaho Act. This met, um, motion um, that has been presented to you um, by the superintendent um, is in accord with the Charaho Act. And we will cross the bridge if and when on June 30th, Hopkinton or, or for that matter, Richmond or Charlestown do not hold um, an act uh, held a referendum as determined by um, the Charaho School Committee. So what you're saying, John, is, is to, just to follow up, is that assuming in the scenario that Hopkinton sticks with their guns and do, does not hold a referendum, then um, you will advise us what to do as far as the approval? Uh, ab 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 absolutely. Okay. At that point. Right. Okay. Thank you. I hope that anyone here from Hopkinton can encourage their town council people to hold the referendum so that the votes can count for sure. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Uh, Craig. To make it as safe as possible for people to come out and vote at the polls. And my follow-up to that is, uh, S Susan, do we budget money to pay for the referendum? Yes. Can you enlighten us on that, please? The towns are able to bill us for their poll workers. Um, in the past, only one town has done so. The other two towns have not, but it is in the budget. All right, thank you. Thanks, Craig. Uh, I have David Stahl and Bill Day. So quick question. Everything about this is uncharted in terms of the pandemic thing and uh, what happens if they don't and what do the votes count or not? All of this is uncharted and is very unique because of the pandemic situation. So. Um, I am echoing, uh, again, what Catherine said. It, it sure would be nice if we could count or include the votes that were taken. I went out and voted as a Hopkinton resident because I knew we were having it, but I also knew, I don't know what this means, and this isn't the date. The school board hasn't said this yet. So it's all uncharted. And it's all very confusing. The, the question I want to ask is, can we do something um, in, our, in our motion to set the renda, referendum? It's also sort of unique to the situation. Um, I know that the Chair Act states that, um, you know, we set a date and it's within 30 days after we've approved. Um, and I, I understand that and I understand why that is. But everything about the situation, no matter how we do it, it's not going to go according to perfect plans and according to perfectly the Chair Act. So what I'm asking is, can we, in setting the date for the referendum, um, set the date for the referendum in the towns 
unless they have already voted on this particular budget and then accept the results of the vote that's been taken. Uh, and I understand that's not question. exactly what the Cheriho Act says, but none of this is really ideally going to get us to exactly what the act says. I, I understand what you're saying. The Cheriho Act says on the same says on the same that the vote will be uh, quote on the same day. Um, again, first of all, I want to make it very clear that the Cheriho School Committee and the Cheriho Regional School District has not violated the Cheriho Act at all. There has been talk that, oh, Charaho hasn't done that, followed the act and so forth. You have not violated the act at all. You are following the act tonight. That is, you approved a budget and you have approved a date within 30 days on or before June 30th. Um, in terms of what Hopkinton chose, chooses to do, again, I'm not going to speculate. Um, to be fair to Hopkinton, we're giving our Official, we will give our official notice to Hopkinton tomorrow that we have sent that we have set the date. The ball goes back into their court. I will um, assume um, that the, all the, the, the town fathers and mothers of Hopkinton are people of goodwill, um, and that um, they will think very hard in terms of their responsibilities. But I, I understand that, John, but uh, what I'm saying is, as our representative, as our counsel, is there a way that you can help us with language to accomplish what we want, which is to uh, set the referendum date and, and allow the vote that's been taken to be included? Not consistent with the Charaho Act. Yeah, fortunately, Charaho Act, actually, and I, I think a lot of people forget this, but it's it's law it's yeah. it's um legislation um we we can't pick and choose what parts we we want to file uh, follow um i have bill day and then i have donna chambers and then george evan uh, chair if, uh, if i'm not mistaken uh, the towns agreed the uh, town clerks and the uh or the uh board of canvases agreed initially that these dates would would be okay with them so this is not something that that the towns were opposed to as far at, at the town clerk's office or the board of canvases office. This was uh, something that was uh, dis disagreed with in the town of Hopkinton by the town council. Is this, is this not my understanding? Is this correct? Ryan, can I clarify that please? Yeah, Donna, why don't you clarify? Yes, that I spoke with all three town clerks they can't approve a date and i know that there's been some heartache over that they did not approve the date what my question to them was would it be doable on their part to get ballots printed to get workers to get it posted in the paper by june 30th that was all they agreed to i do not want them taking any heat for that date being selected they could not select that date the school committee selects it that's the law so all they did was approve that they could meet that date with their requirements as town clerks to print the ballots, post the meeting, and get workers. That is what they approved, and they all said it was doable. It was close. It was a tight, tight timeline for them, which everybody needs to know that. I know people are co concerned with why we put it out to June 30th. It was tight for them but they can do it. That's what they agreed to. They can meet that date. Thank you. Uh, I have Donna Chambers and then George Abbott. Um, let me just say, David, that the pandemic is uncharted territory. What is not uncharted territory is the Cheriho Act. We've all been aware of it. All the towns have been aware of it. This is how we do our budget. And so that is the law, as John pointed out, that is not uncharted territory. Uh, George Abbott. John, is it your opinion that the votes that were cast in Hopkinton concerning the Cheriho budget on, I believe it was June 9th, are invalid? Um, it's my opinion that we're following the Cheriho Act now by setting a budget and we're, we're you're officially saying today 
uh, um, you know, June, June 15th, June 16th, whatever the date is today, to, today, you are setting what the budget is June 16th, and that you are then giving them the notice to hold it within 30 days. So the budget was set about, you know, 15 minutes ago. Now, are those votes invalid, the votes that Hopkinton took? I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to speak for what Hopkinton thinks or Hopkinton says. I'm simply saying that your vote today is to set a budget. There has not been a budget set prior to today that a vote was conducted within 30 days. So you're setting the vote. We're setting a vote within 30 days. We're setting it before July 1st. As uh, Mrs. Chambers said, this is not new te territory. We are following the act as written. I'm not gonna, you know, again, I said to you before that I believe that the, the, that the town fathers and mothers of Hopkinton are people of good faith. We will communicate with them that we have followed the Charaho Act and I'm not gonna cross any other bridges until we get to them. Uh, Clay. Yeah, so we've been dealt a tough hand, but you have to play the hand you're given. Um, I support the June 30th date for a vote. I think it's the best we can do. Um, so I'm going to vote for it. The biggest concern I have about it, though, is it's a very tight timeline, and it may cause people that can't vote in person that would want a mail-in ballot to not be able to get one. But, I mean, we got to do the best we can do. Thanks. Thanks, Clay. Um, MTC owner. Oh, sorry, sorry, Just Ryan. Take your name in town. Sure, Robin Woodmancy, Richmond. Sorry about hey, that. It's my work email. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say, I know the whole thing is, quite frankly, a, a mess in a, a tough situation, right? Um, my concern is the residents of Hoppington. They're kind of caught in the middle of all this, so. They're caught in between the who say of what the school committee feels is right and what the town feels is right. And they're stuck in the middle in between this big fight. And it's not quite fair to the residents. Um, so I'm not sure what is the right thing to do, but I think it's very important that we remember our residents and our taxpayers. They went out and voted. They had a very usual turnout for their vote. And while it isn't in line with Chara Ho Act, um, everything's so crazy right now. This is nothing we've ever done before. So I don't think, I know the Chara Ho Act never had this situation in mind. So that's my two thoughts on that. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. So uh, Bill Day. Uh, yeah, so Chara Act's a Chara Act. The Chara Act's been in, is 50 years. We've, we've, we've dealt this way. I, we cannot, John, I think has said probably three or four times already, we cannot change the Charo Act. We tried to change the Charo Act for, for less uh, controversial things than this, and we couldn't get anywhere with the town. So we've got to live with this Charo Act. Uh, there's been many, many of, of the individuals in the town of Hopsikin, especially, that always remind us that we got to follow the Charo Act. We're trying to follow the Charo Act. And we're, we're taking heat. We're not, we don't deserve any heat. We're doing what the Charo Act says we're doing. And we're not going to, I'm not going to stand around and take heat for this as a school committee member. And neither, and no one on this committee should take any heat for this. This is the Charo Act. Follow it. And this is what we're doing. And I think we should, unless if somebody's got something new, I think we should be moving on here. I've got Sue Rogers. Um, I just wanted to comment on something that Clay had said. I don't think that the Cherho vote has ever allowed mail-in ballots. I think that it has always had to be an in-person vote. I could be wrong, and uh, John or Donna might be able to correct me, but I don't think we've ever had that ability. I'm not, I'm not aware of mail-in ballots, but obviously, I, you know, I've been working for Cherho for uh, 12 years now. I, I, not, I haven't been around for 50. All right, so I have Craig, Catherine, and then 
Finn Lefkowitz, and then Sheila Grover. And then, I'm sorry, Craig, Catherine, George, and then Vin and Sheila. John? Hello? We can hear you, Craig. Yes, yes Craig. All right. Um, let me ask. I know the answers for these, but I got to ask the questions anyhow. Uh, who created the Cheroho Act? Cheroho Act was enacted by originally back in 1958 by the General Assembly. It was substantially rewritten, I believe, in 1987. I believe it was approved by both the General Assembly and the voters at that time. There have been minor amendments since then. But the three towns created the, 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 the voters of the three towns along with the General Assembly. Does the school committee have the authority to change the Cheraho Act? I can't hear you, sir. No. All right. All right. So if we cannot deviate from the Cheraho Act tonight. The answer is no, and there's no reason to deviate from the I, I, I understand that. Deadlines. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So, Catherine, George, Ben, and then Sheila. I, um, I was just going to restate what I had said before. I know we all understand the Cheroho Act. Um, I know the town councils understand the Cheroho Act. And not at all in agreement with what the town of Hopkinton did. I get it. And I agree with the school committee. However, there are 200 and I think it was seven people who went out and voted for this budget and 177 who voted against it, who made time to go and cast a ballot for something that thought they thought might count. That's all that, that's the final mm -hmm. thought. Thank you. Thank you. George. Yes, this question is for John. Is it your opinion, John, that these votes that were cast on June 9th should be or shouldn't be incorporated, added or subtracted to the uh, June 30th vote? And again, it's my position based on the Charho Act, which says that all three communities shall vote on the same day, that if you vote, if the majority of you vote for this motion that is before you, that on June 30th, um, that all three communities will vote on the same day and that you will total up the votes. So those votes would be disenfranchised? They're not, and with all due respect, Mr. Abbott, the Chariho Act specifies that the school committee determines the date and the school committee, then, then the towns hold the referendum and that the date is within 30 days and before July mm -hmm. 1st. So we can't, you know, as somebody else said here, we can't pick and choose the parts of the Charaho Act we like or don't like. You will recall that there was a um, thought given and in terms of exploring every single possible opportunity that we had, that one possibility was to ask the governor to approve an executive order just like the governor of Connecticut did over the state line and just like the governor of Massachusetts did to deal with the special problems of regional school districts. <clears throat> Members of this committee made it very clear that that was totally unacceptable. The consequence of that is, is that we are left with, pass, with following through on the Charaho Act. We have been fortunate that the governor has increased the number of people who can um, be in one place at a time to 15. We are fortunate that the town clerks indicated to Donna that they were capable of doing it on June 30th. And we are fortunate that we are able to get all of you together today to discuss it, to approve the budget, which you have already done, and hopefully to set the date. And we will have lived within the Charaho Act as again, members of some members of the committee have insisted from the get go. Did you advise the Hopkinton Town Council that the vote on June 9th was illegal and outside the Charo Act? 
I'm not advising the, the, the Hopkinton Town Council is not my client. I'm here advising the Charaho School Committee how to follow the Charaho Act. And the Char and again, I, I've said it, you know, I'll say it for the sixth time. You need to um, vote a budget, pick a date, vote on the date. That's what you're doing here tonight. Thanks, John. Okay, folks. Um, I see two uh, hands still up. I want to give an opportunity for Vin and Sheila to speak, but uh, if there's nothing new after that, I would like to move forward on this. So, Vin, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, I just have a question. I mean, I know that we're, we're talking about uncharted territories and so on and so forth. So, the, the ultimate answer that I'm looking for is, all right, let's say Hopkinton decides not to hold a referendum vote on the 30th. I need to know the next step, and I think the district does as well, because you got 40 members, 40 teachers that have layoff notices that could be looking for other jobs. Um, with, with all of that up in the air, how are you going to do schedules? I, I think you need to look at the contract as to when schedules are supposed to go out. Um, the longer we kick this down the road, the, the, the more severe it's going to not just impact teachers, but it's going to impact students, it's going to impact parents, because if we're just going to keep, you know, going round and round, I mean, I, I respect that John doesn't, you know, want to, you know, cross that bridge, but I think it, it's a discussion that needs to be had. I think I need to be able to go back to my members and give them an answer as to what will happen on June or July 1, if Hopkinton decides to tap out? It's a great I, question, Ben. And I'm gonna simply say what I've said in the past. I'm not gonna cross that bridge unless I have to. But John, I think it's time to cross the bridge because if Hopkinton is gonna sit there and say, we're not holding another vote, I need to be able to tell 40 members, 40 families what they should be doing because I'm getting a lot of people that are saying, hey, should I be looking for another job? And if, and gonna, if, and and if the district can't get their act together, then I might as well tell them to, to do that. And that would be a detriment to this district. I wanna make it very clear that the district has its act together and the district is following the Charaho Act. The school committee made it very, very clear that they expected the Charaho Act. There were alternatives explored and the school committee said, no, we do not want to explore other legal alternatives. The alternative that the committee has made clear that they want to follow is the Charaho Act, and we are following that process. And if the town of Hopkins doesn't follow that process, we will decide, we will cross that bridge when it comes. It is my hope that the um, folks that run the town of Hopkinton um, will be as supportive of the Charaho Act as the members of the school committee have already been. Well, all I can say in, in closing is that I hope that the committee um, decides on what they're gonna do, what their response is gonna be on July 1, because everybody who's impacted in this has a right to know. The committee's doing their job. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mr. Day, I appreciate that. So are the teachers. So we're gonna move on. And we're going to have Sheila, oh, I'm sorry, uh, David Stahl had his hand up and then Sheila Grover. I just want to say, I, it, we may, Mr. Chair, I don't know procedurally how we do this, but I, I think in, a, in respect to what, uh, what Vin is saying um, and, and for teachers and for planning and that sort of thing, um, can we have or can we set something uh, as a, as a, if Hopkinton doesn't have a vote, something that's a special meeting uh, or some, some way that we would respond to that sooner um, than waiting till the next meeting. I, I hear what he's saying and, it, and, it, and I think he's bringing an important perspective. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know procedurally what that is. So I'm, I'm just kicking that to you, Chair, as an idea mm. of, of can we tonight for everyone's peace of mind say, we, we, everything that we know so far is that Hopkinton's not planning another vote. Um, so if they don't have one, um, and we have a, a sort of a crisis here, we will meet at, at, at an earlier time. We will address this and what I know we can't, we can't say what we'll do because we don't know what they're going to do. I understand what John's saying, but for yeah. us to plan to meet or to plan to plan is not a bad thing. 
and I would, would uh, un understood that. And, and I think that um, my understanding of what Hopkinton is intending to do is their municipal vote is next. They've included our budgeted dollars in their municipal vote because it, according to them, it passed on the ninth. That's on the 23rd. So our hope is that they will pass the municipal vote and that they will hold the referendum on the 30th in compliance with the Cherahoe Act. Um, as far as pulling an emergency meeting and, and that kind of thing, there's not much we can do until probably the week afterwards. They have to be in violation of something for us to respond to it, and we'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. But to your point, um, with respect to our response, it will have to be much quicker than um, than waiting for our, our next school committee meeting. Um, I have Bill Day, Donna Chambers, and then Sheila Grover. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would uh, defer to Sheila because I, I intend to make a motion to move this question. We, we are going nowhere with this. We, uh, John Anderson has said for the umpteenth time that we're following the Charo Act. He's not going to give anybody any, any fuel to, to, to throw on the fire. So let's move on here. And, and we got more Mr. important things to do tonight than to say what if, maybe if, how, why, what, when, where, whatever. This, we're, 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 we're spinning our wheels for no reason. We cannot divide, the, divulge any legal things that Mr. Anderson has. Mr. Anderson has been very, very uh, diligent in, in researching this and he knows what he's talking about. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll defer to Sheila and then I, I would like to make a motion to move this question. Sheila. Hi, uh, I'll be quick. I just wanted to say that I definitely appreciate that the school committee is absolutely done the right thing from the from day one and has followed the Chair of Act to the letter. And I think that it is wise to have a contingency in plan because I think it's highly unlikely that Hopkinton will comply. That's the reality of it. But you're right, you can't do anything about it now. But um, I just want it out there because I think that it needs to be said that this, the school committee has done its job. It has not shirked its responsibility. It came up with a date as soon as it was possible to have a vote and that needs to be a, of public record. That's important. Thank you. Bill. Yes, I'd like to move the question. Yeah. Motion to move the question. Those in favor of moving the question. I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, we've got two thirds. Question is moved. We are now voting on the motion. Motion is to set the random, uh, referendum date for June 30th. Those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? Any recusals? Thank you all. Motion carries. Uh, uh, Ryan, that's unanimous, yes? It's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Was moving the question unanimous as well? Oh, we didn't vote on that. <laughs> we, we did. It was two thirds majority. I don't, I had 10. I didn't see the last two hands. Did anybody oppose I have on moving the, the question? Names. Yep, uh, I got gotcha. you. Any... I'll have to list names. If not, if you can just give me those who. Okay, well, let me, let me clarify. Any committee members on moving the vote, did anyone oppose that? Did anyone abstain or recuse? John, it was unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you all. This brings us to letter G. Okay, update on phase two uh, related to COVID. Summer plans and school reopening for 2020-2021. So this item was requested from a parent and uh, committee member David Stahl. I believe Mr. Um, 
I believe Murad also requested information on this. Um, so the first part of what I was gonna provide was just an update on the summer plans related to COVID. So um, for our ESY extended school year program, uh, Jen Durkin did do a presentation at a previous school committee on what that plan would be. And she then had to submit a plan to um, RIDE, Department of Education. And when we, uh, we got a response from RIDE and they, they didn't approve a plan, they weren't really really doing that, but they didn't provide any feedback for improvement and we didn't have to resubmit. So in a sense, that's approval. I know other districts got back letters that asked for more information. So I want to congratulate Jen on the thorough job she did in completing the plan. Um, and again, that's our summer plan for extended school year. It will be in essence virtual. The other um, summer program, um, this is new and this evening actually, I'm going to recommend approval of the Charaho phase two return to athletics plan. And um, that is in front of you. And this, this plan actually begins on June 18th, after school ends, so this Thursday, because tomorrow is our last day of school. And um, this is a plan that Mike Shields worked on, along with reading and reviewing guidelines from the Rhode Island Interscholastic League. And it's really, I thought, I, important to bring out because it's our first, um, plan which really involves bringing some students back and you know what you'll notice in the plan is that the groups of students or stable groups are limited right now to 15 people and that includes students and coaches um, that no students will be in multiple groups so you don't want um, students to, to cross over you want them to remain in just their own single pod or stable group. They will be uh, practicing social distancing. That's gonna be encouraged. Um, they're really not phys doing physical contact in these sports. They're more gonna practice on individual skills and drills and strengthening activities. Um, so the physical contact will be very limited. And um, you can see on the document in your packet that um, it's a limited number of teams and they are all outside. So it's a limited number of sports activities that are going to start out on Monday through Friday in the evenings and again 15 per group and all of the different activities take place outdoors. So it's our first return um, with, with some students. And um, you'll also see the COVID-19 screening tool as part of that packet that's re um, recommended from Rhode Island Department of Health. And that is the same screening tool that we use as a district. We have this hung up in all of our buildings outside so that when people come in, they then ask these questions. So it's really a two-part item. Um, again, starting with summer plans. and um if we can do a, a we can if we want to talk about the summer plans right now and if we want to take a vote on that and then i can also then talk to you about reopening in september would that be appropriate yes yeah let's let's take the recommendation first and then we'll talk about reopening yeah so can you read it again the recommendation yeah, absolutely I recommend approval of the Charaho Phase Two Return to Athletics Plan. So moved. Second. Second. Hey, thank you. Motion by Craig, second by Catherine. Approval for the Charaho Phase Two Return to Athletics Athletics Plan. This is open for discussion. I recognize Craig was on. And then I have a several questions. Uh, Mike Shields, you're still here with us, right? Yes, I am. Hey, how are you? How's your summer going? Good, thank you. Okay, uh, looking at the schedule, um, first of all, there's some sports here that are out of season. Is there a reason why? For the last, well, since I've become athletic director of 10 years ago, um, I've always asked coaches 
to become involved during the summertime for um, a number of reasons. One, um, it gives athletes a chance to work on their, continue to work on their skills. Um, and it also gives our coaches more time to develop connections and, and relationships with those players and, and athletes. So during the summertime, there is, there is a lot of um, activities. So you have basketball, um, you know, there's hockey at Boss Arena. There's generally passing leagues for football. There's baseball, softball. There's every sport imaginable that happens during the summer. So, you know, it's up to the coaches if they want to, um, you know, run a program or not. We don't force them to, but I encourage them to. And many of our coaches have. And, and I think that that's just an example of, you know, our coaches are willing to work with our athletes in the offseason to, to make them better. So, um, you know, the, what you see is just the schedule of teams that showed interest um, as of when I put that schedule together for summer training. Um, I know during the summertime, Bill Habrack usually has what's called a run for fun. He's, he's done that for probably 30 years. Yep. Um, I'm in contact with him as far as what that might look like if he says to me, Mike, I think I can do it. Um, you know, can we figure out a plan? So. Um, I've been working, you know, just trying to get a schedule together to see what that might look like. But again, these are, um, this isn't abnormal to see a number of different athletic teams um, because many of them are playing during the summertime. So, follow, I, like I said, I had several questions. So, following that up, uh, is the state uh, bending the interscholastic rules where are they allowing a coach to be coaching the kids in the off seasons? I thought no, two, 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 with that. Two, no, two years ago, I served on a committee with the uh, athletic directors because I'm the vice president of the athletic directors in Rhode Island. I served on a committee to develop a plan to allow coaches to work with student athletes in the summertime. The Interscholastic League um, and us worked together, and we came up with June 15th as the start date. So for, from June 15th to August 17th this year, um, coaches can work with players and not break any uh, RIL bylaws. Um, going back six, seven, eight, ten 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I coached, you couldn't work with athletes in the summertime, but now you, you are able to. Okay. So uh, my next one is, is with football. Uh, you got 15, 15, 50, total of 60. Football, sometimes you get a large group. What's, what's, what, what a, makes you that? It's, it's a total of no more than 45. So we have three groups. It should be, it should be three groups of 15, no more than 45. Um, we're staying under the – we're staying at 15 because according to the governor's guidelines for youth sports, you can have multiple groups on a field as long as you are spaced out appropriately. So – we're going to use the field, you know, their practice field that they have, which is uh, b basically over 100 yards. And we'll, they would be able to space out appropriately with, you know, three groups going at one time. Um, I did talk to Nick Russo. W what we're going to probably do is, is do, do two groups once and then one group at the end. Um, so, you know, so there's not much overlap, but and you don't have a lot of people on the field at the same time. But the field is big enough to – um, you know, to hold the practices that we need to, to hold due to the guidelines. Again, I mean, athletics during the summertime isn't anything new for us. We've been doing it for a while. We just need – we are just following guidelines that the governor set forth. So, you know, I've gone over this with the coaches twice. We've met. We've had good discussions. They all have the same guidelines. They're providing me their practice plans. If this gets approved, I'll have the practice plans, um, and I'll review them. But I, I've looked at them already from the coaches. So. You know, they're, they're ready to go, and the student-athletes are – they're very eager to come back and, and have some sense of normalcy using the guidelines. Well, my last question, but getting back to football real quick, you have uh, two, two groups the first night and two groups the second night, 15 per group. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still counting 60. I don't know where you're seeing 45. So my last question is the screening tool. Um, you know, I go to PT every week, and I just walk in the door, and they run the thermometer across my forehead. Are we going to be doing that at uh, all of these? 
it's we're using the guidelines from the governor and the guidelines don't state we have to take a temperature the guidelines state to use the screening tool so the coach will screen every athlete that comes in okay parents also parents also receive what you're reading the parents also have received and they will receive the the screening tool we've asked them to screen their child before they they send them to practice and if they see two or more of the of the symptoms then we ask them to keep them home and they have to sign off on that that they did read it as well all right thank you very much you're welcome thank you lisa um hi mike i want to let you know that i intend on supporting um the return to athletics plan um but i do have two questions that um, need to be addressed for um, the, our, our families in the community. Um, what's not evident in the plan is how this will be enforced. And so I think we need to have a conversation, have an understanding as to what steps will be taken or what actions may be taken if um, participants or athletes show up without face coverings. Um, if they don't um, adhere to the physical distancing, if they come in a car with um, people outside of their family pod, what will we be doing to ensure that they take this seriously? Um, so that's one question. And the second is I, I'm concerned about access to um, PPE for all of our athletes. And can we consider um, providing face coverings as part of uh, the uniform purchase? I know that Under Armour, right, is coming up and developing um, a specialized face covering for athletes. And is that something that we can incorporate so that all of our athletes have equal access to protective gear in the same way that we provide helmets and we provide every other um, form of protection for them? So, so the first part is if athletes don't follow the guidelines, they're just going to be sent home. Um, parents have to sign off on the, that they've read the guidelines and understand them. Uh, part of the guidelines is every athlete needs to have a mask on them. They don't have to wear it. The youth guidelines state that athletes, the, when they're involved in activity, they don't have to wear the mask, but we want them to have it on them. So if it's in their pocket, if it's around their neck, if it's stuffed in between their short, that's fine, but they have to have the mask on them. If an athlete comes without the mask or if they come in a car with more people, um, outside of the family, they're going to be sent home and they're not coming back. So our coaches have made it pretty clear and, and they will make it even clearer when they meet with the athletes for the very first time. They will explain in person, which is obviously a lot easier to do, um, the importance of the guidelines and, and why those guidelines are here. And, and we will follow them to the T. And if, if people don't follow them, then we're just going to tell them they need to leave and they're not coming back. Um, so as we respect that, your, your response is ideal. Right, because within our community, we certainly have different schools of thought um, as to uh, how to proceed with um, like COVID protection. So as a school committee, right, and as a district, that's exactly, right, the answer that I want to hear, that while the students are in, within our care, um, protecting their safety, um, they have to adhere to this, regardless of what their personal practice might be at home, right? Right, absolutely, and that's, you know, and, and you know, when it comes to the students driving, you know, when kids drive, they are not allowed to pick up um, somebody that's not in their family, uh, you know, and come to practice. If we see that, then they're, they're going to lose the privilege to practice. And I think, you know, when that, when we set that tone the very first day, um, you know, and, and I expect the kids are going to follow that because this is their first opportunity to come back. They've been out for over 90 days. So I, I think they're very eager to come back and, and they are very willing to, to follow the guidelines. Um, as far as the, having masks for um, anyone that, that doesn't have one. Um, that's something that was certainly as we go through the budget process and uh, hopefully um, we can start doing our orders through, through July. Th that's something that we can look at ordering if we need to, absolutely, um, to make sure that everybody's equipped. Um, but on the, on the um, sign off, it does state that, you know, everyone needs to have a mask or a cloth face covering. So we expect that everybody will come, you know, with one. Uh, we can certainly have some available if, if a child, you know, for some reason doesn't have one or can't afford one. But um, through the budget process, we can start doing that. But it won't happen until probably the second week in July. That's usually when I start ordering for the fall, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, so, Chair, just last follow-up for Susan and Jane. Um, 
do we have, are any of the funds available, the federal funds um, that are being distributed to school districts, can we tap into any of that money to provide protective um, face coverings for our athletes? So, um, uh, thank you for asking that question, Lisa. And I'm, Sue can also jump in. But one of one issue um, as we think about reopening is also the availability of um, some of the products, including masks. I do know, though, that Susan is been is working with other districts um, in Southern Rhode Island as a group to be able to purchase items. And I know she has put in purchases already and requests for masks. Um, I'm, I have to say, though, I'm not sure of the timeline of when they're going to be coming in. So we have already actually placed some orders um, so that we are prepared, but availability is going to be an issue. The other side of that is uh, that CARES Act money that we are supposed to be eligible for. The district is supposed to be able to put in for that money through something called Excel Grants. And that's, um, Wright has to turn that on, Wright has to have that all set up, and they have been telling us for a couple of weeks now, it's coming soon. Mm. Still not up, it's still not available, so we haven't been able to even begin to put in requests. Thank you all. Thank you. Any, Jane? Just one other thing I wanted to add, because um, I, I, I know she's on the call. Gina Picard um, met with myself and Mike on this also, because it is starting on June 18th, um, which will be her first day. So she is, she was also part of the development of um, these guidelines, and she does approve. Thank you. Further discussion? And we have a motion and a second to approve the Cherho Phase Two Return to Athletics Plan. Those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstaining? Donna, Donna Chambers abstaining. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? No. Uh, any recusals? Thank you. So it's. It's uh, 11 in favor and one abstention. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, so reopening. Um, so you, yes. um, you may have heard the governor's press conference um, last, well, I, I've lost track of the days, I have to be honest, but it was fairly recent. And um, at her press conference, what she talked about is her goal which is for 100% in-person return for September. Um, what she's asking the districts to do is to develop plans, um, really three sets of plans. One set of plans would be 100% uh, of students returned. The next would be um, limited in-person return. And then the last would be um, you know, more restrictive where um, we may have to, let's say there was an outbreak and we had to close a school um, and, and you wouldn't be able to return that building. So we have to have three sets of plans. The state ride, and people had asked about some of these guidelines, they are coming out with health and safety guidelines. Those will be released this Friday. So on June 19th, they're gonna be uh, putting out health and safety guidelines, which then districts can start to use to develop those three plans. And in your packet, what you have, um, let me just make sure, you have something that is called, it's in blue, and it's the Reimagining Rhode Island Education Fall Reopening Plan Framework. So just to give you information, that particular framework is a draft, and they're going to continue to update that, and we should get an final updated ride planning framework, this is districts, on June 24th. Um, and that particular framework will include protocols and further information that will help us with planning. Because then, and just a few weeks after, on July 17th, every district has to submit a plan, those three plans. 
about coming back again 100%, maybe a hybrid, or um, where it's much more restricted. So I just think one thing that people have to realize is that school in September, no matter what, is not gonna look the same as it did this last September. So things that we have to think about is we start to think about developing those plans. And I think the um, summer, the sports plan was a good introduction to it for you, is that we'll have maximum um, group sizes. So you're not gonna be able to have 100 students in the lunchroom, for example. Um, you're gonna have possibly stable pods of students that you might think about. And how do you keep those stable pods apart, um, either you know, from other pods in the school? I don't think the expectation is you're gonna have the students in the classroom always being able to stay you know, 14 feet apart or six feet apart, um, but that that stable pod um, is more self-contained and then doesn't interact with another pod throughout the day. So we have to, a lot of considerations. What are the classrooms gonna look like? You know, um, the thinking is that students would be in rows, um, but that's opposite of what we've been working on in education for the last 20 years is, you know, when we think about students in classrooms, we group them together and we collaborate and we move kids around so that they can work together. And we have to think about it differently for September. We have to think about what is it gonna look like in the hallways when students are passing? Are we gonna have like in the grocery store, arrows where one hallway is just one direction? And do we have to rethink that? Um, the biggest issue that continues to come up on multiple calls that I've been on with RIDE, with the governor and with the superintendents association is bus transportation. And that came up this evening earlier. Um, one thing is, you know, there are guidelines out there from the CDC. What I just heard on a call at five o'clock this evening with the governor was that um, when it comes to buses, our guidelines in Rhode Island might not be the same as the CDC because the other thing we have to think about is this is 10 weeks from now. In 10 weeks from now, things are gonna be most likely different and we'll be in phase three um, as compared to where we are today. So we're also trying to plan for 10 weeks ahead where we really don't know exactly what it's gonna look like in 10 weeks. But assuming that we'll be back in phase, we'll be in phase three, um, the restrictions will change. One of the things that I heard about with buses is they talked about, you know, of course we have to provide busing for all, everybody, but there are some people that do prefer to bring their students to school. And maybe, you know, in the past, it, they would still put them on the bus many times, but maybe if they could drive kids to school, that's gonna to help to limit some students on the bus. The other thing is you do have to have them, um, you know, apart, but if they're in the same family, they could certainly sit together. So there's a lot of considerations and things that have to be thought about um, in terms of developing a plan. <clears throat> and, you know, it's all just new. So I, I can't really provide a lot of information as how we're gonna do it in Sharaho for you this evening, but I can let you know that um, guidelines are gonna be coming from the state, that we'll then be developing our plan, and that um, you know a lot of people around the state are working on this. And um, you know, I, I think that again, the goal is to have kids back. And we just got to figure out the best way we can do that to make sure that they're going to be safe, the staff and the students. Um, but there's just a lot of things to think about. Um, and many of them were already discussed earlier this evening when we were talking about some of the updates to this year's budget. The other thing is just, um, you know, on the last call that I just had this evening before the school committee meeting uh, with superintendents and the governor was that we just all need to think um, innovatively. There are solutions, there are creative ways to address it. We just have to think outside the box. We have to think differently um, so that we can try to see how we can best do that. And I think, again, Mike's plan was just a small microcosm, but a, just a good example of how we started to think about that and what it will look like.
Um, so that I believe is all I have. Any questions? Yeah, we have uh, Donna Chambers and then I see Lisa and then Bill Day. Jane, I can't even, and Gina, I can't even imagine the decisions that have to be made. Um, and Lisa, Lisa asked Mike about the consequences of not complying with the regulations and the, the, the um, mandates of keeping the kids apart. What do we do when the kids in the first grade, second grade, third grade do not comply with what they're supposed to be doing? We cannot say, sorry, you're not going to participate. Um, this, is in, this is a monumental, I don't have to tell you, this is monumental. And are there plans in place to how to control the kids in a way that is emotionally sound for these kids? You can't say, we're sending you home because you, you're not keeping your hand off Johnny. Um, so, I, I mean, there's so many, so many different aspects of this, but mostly I'm concerned about the compliance and how do we keep kids apart. Yeah. Thank you. Jane? I don't know if you wanted me to answer that, if it was more just something to think about. I think it's something to think about. Jane, I think it's something seriously to think about. I'm reading so much about the emotional impact this is going to have on the kids. Yeah. What do the teachers do? How do the teachers manage this? Mm -hmm. This is so many aspects of this. Thank you. That's a rhetorical question. Anyway, thank you. I have uh, Lisa McPherson next. Jane, I'm so happy to hear um, you say things like we need to, we can think about this creatively, right? We can think outside of the box that the, the CDC and, and the governor's regulations will be the floor, but we can, right? We can um, take that in, in a different direction. And I just want you and Gina both to know that um, I will be eager to hear creative and out of the box solutions. Um, in terms of what, what Donna was bringing forward, one of those answers is mindfulness, right? One of the answers to how to help students contain their emotions and their feelings and their anxiety and their frustration and however that might manifest, right? And what that looks like in a 12 year old and a 15 year old and a nine year old can be through mindfulness practice. So um, I think some of those answers were presented earlier today. I do think we also probably need to revisit some of our policies and kind of what our community standards are going to look like um, and what our behavior protocols are going to be look like. I mean, we, we may have to add some of that in just to give our administrators, because um, remember, as school committee members, all we have right now is policy, right? Our, our main influence is policy. And so we may, might want to put on rotation uh, looking at some of those things over the next couple of weeks. I remember um, that Gina had some experience with um, poli sub policy subcommittees um, that she had talked to us about. So maybe we at our next meeting or um, when she's finally like, you know, contracted, um, we can think about that too. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention in terms of the out of the box thinking, um, bossing. I, at some point, if we could get a breakdown of what it costs, say, per student per day to run buses under the new COVID regulations, um, I wonder if there is some way that we can offer or consider offering families incentives, right, uh, to transport their students to school. And that's not to say that families need to be motivated to do so, but it's to say that there's an economic barrier sometimes and having families be able to afford, right, what it takes to transport a student to and from school every day. And so we might want to look financially at, um, is there funding or, or could there be options for helping that, um, whether that is something as as, as goofy as, you know, uh, um, you know, gas cards. Um, what is the cost of transporting each student per day in a COVID scenario, in a 15 student per bus scenario? Um, and is there some, some tracks that we can lay down that way temporarily? Keeping in mind, this is not forever, right? This is not going to be for the next five years, we hope, right, two years. This is going to be a stopgap measure so that we don't bankrupt ourselves and then we can continue to provide 
the, the education that we've been providing and get through hopefully one more winter, right? And into next year and, and be in a, in a better position um, in terms of our health and safety. So those are my thoughts. Um, but again, just to reiterate, I'm definitely open to creative problem solution and, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Thank you. Uh, Bill Day, and then I have David, uh, Murat, and Donna. Uh, Jane uh, uh, and George. Jane, you and uh, Jane have been involved in politics and education or long enough, and and I think that uh, what you're going to have to do is, in, in spite of thinking outside the boxes, you're going to have to direct your guidelines very similar to what the state of Rhode Island wants it wants because we've known known in the past that we've had some innovative things go down here at Charaho and the state of Rhode Island has turned around and said no no turn around and, and go go the way we want you to go. So I'm hoping that you try to do some things that are going to be different, but don't go too far off the rail as far as the state of Rhode Island is concerned because in the past the state of Rhode Island has uh shot down some very uh, innovative things that we tried to do down here at Charo. And the other thing that uh, I did want to comment on, <clears throat> as much as uh, it might seem uh, beneficial to, uh, to encourage parents to bring their kids to school, if you've ever been near any of these elementary schools and even at the high school, when these parents are coming in, you're going to have traffic jams mega chopper jams all over the place so uh, that's not necessarily going to be a problem solver because uh, kids are going to be late getting into school with the with the traffic jams that are going to be involved with the parents bus, uh, driving their kids to school thank you thanks bill uh david Stoll. yeah i like i like uh what lisa said and, and bill's comment about it um that's that's just you know another layer of thinking creatively about those things is if we if we can have parents drive kids, uh, but we know what a bottleneck that would create, Bill, with the traffic, but that's where you do staggered start times or staggered drop off times with parents, and you know just think it through two or three levels to uh, the obvious problem is traffic jams, but there's then there's solutions. So uh, I'm thinking about um, one of the one of the things that I've been. We, we talk about the pods, Jane, and keeping the groups of, of kids kind of together. And I don't know how far the state will let those things go, but some of the things that I've just talked about with people that seem like great things to, to be thinking about are, are staggering groups of kids in the building. You know, we've had people ask about, can one group of kids be in the building on Mondays and Wednesdays and the other on Tuesdays and Thursdays? And then everyone does something virtual on Fridays or are, are there different ways that you can have different groups of kids in the building on different days and still get much more time in the building, but not everybody there at once. Um, so alternating days or even alternating weeks, students are in the building Monday through Friday and then not the next week and the other half are in the next week. Are there things that you can do like that that are really staggering um, who's in there at once? And we, we kept going back to this conversation about some of the virtual things that worked or wanting to carry some of those over. And we know that for a lot of students, it just doesn't work at all. But for some students, it worked really well. Mm -hmm. Are we able to give more um, flexibility or give an option for parents or students to volunteer to continue virtually? Um, and, and if we're going to do that, I know what we're saying is, well, now if teachers have kids in the classroom, and virtual they can't do both of those things and they can't double however it's very simple now uh, with the technology in place to stream what's happening in the classroom so teachers aren't repeating lectures um, for for those virtual students instead of getting a separate um, lecture or a separate interaction with the teacher to have the recording of what's happening in the classroom um, those things are really doable now so is there some sort of um, volunteering um, for students to be given an option of staying virtual for the ones that it's worked really well for to cut our numbers down for the first semester or the first trimester or, um, is, is that something like that an option and also because we're going to have the health uh, issues and people's having to self-quarantine or people not coming 
more more days missed because of sickness and we're going to have to re revisit that policy with attendance and the health stuff that virtual option could help with that as well so could we kill two birds with one stone by having a more virtual option that's not virtual in the sense that everybody's virtual but virtual in the sense that a group can be virtual and experience what's happening in the room through video um, and that's a volunteer basis or to manage the quarantining or health issues those were some thoughts that I wanted us to be thinking about. Thank you. Um, you're at. Um, I basically had a question about the, um, the expectation that Gina and Jane will have, because I was looking at the uh, governor's uh, was like stage three of reopening and there is a lot of things that are still instructions need uh, expected uh, to be kind of uh, defined later so how much of that do you believe will help you in the planning for what's going to happen in the fall because as, as people said here you know we will not be able to deviate much nor probably should we from what the state guidance will be um, and I know it's only you know few short weeks away so we kind of need to start planning but I would be probably be asking you to be more or really, really proactive kind of probing state for hey what how should we do this what's the guidance so we don't spend time and energy uh, developing something that you know will be actually kind of you know somewhat a waste of an effort if it if it deviates too far from what the state wants uh, or sees it happening um, because I think it's a really challenging problem. I mean, you you, you kind of have to obey the distancing and then the grouping limitations as as they stand right now, and yet accommodate kids in the same class rooms and same buildings. So I I don't I don't see I don't have a clear picture of how we're going to be able to do that. Further question or comment on that? All right, Donna, I see Donna and then George and then Lisa. Well, it, it kind of goes along with what Bill was saying and Murat is saying. I hope the state gives the districts some autonomy to think outside the box. I think this is a perfect opportunity to try new and innovative things and, and, and not restrict the kinds of things that they have in education in the past. I mean, the community is here, the libraries are here, people could homeschool. I mean, there's so many opportunities to try new things. And I hope to gosh that the state allows the districts to reasonably come up with plans that are outside of the box without, and use their own autonomy to make those decisions and capture the data so that we can look at what we're doing and how kids are learning in different ways. The second question I would have, this is a question for Jane or Gina, has, has, have any of the parents, like especially the kindergarten parents, have they said, I'm not sending my child to school this year? And, and, and rather they would choose to homeschool under the, under the guidance of the school district. Has anybody talked so, about that? Yeah. I, I, probably, I probably had emails, two or three parents um, that are, are very concerned about having their students return, not specific to kindergarten, but um, the, a small number so far, but we're very early in the process. Right. Um, and, uh, but I'm sure there are parents that are, you know, feel that way or they feel that way or they're not sure about September, but maybe they want to wait two weeks and see, you know, how it works out when, when we come back. Um, um, so, I mean, there, I think there are some people that feel that way. And I think though, again, 10 weeks from now, I, I just think things are going to, we don't know what it's going to be like 10 weeks from now. But if parents came and said, you know, I'd like to opt out, is there any, curriculum in place that I could follow to homeschool with the guidance of the district as we move along. Um, well, we have, I mean, we have a homeschool policy, but that would be different, okay. I think, than what you're talking about. So homeschool is right. when the parent takes responsibility for 
the child's education. And I think what you're talking about is more, you know, could the student get their education virtually? And, and I think that's all gonna have to be considered when we develop our plan moving forward. Um, what options are we gonna be able to provide? Thank you. Thank you. George. Following up what Bill said, uh, we had discussed this many years ago um, in terms of parents transporting their kids to school. And I believe the consensus back then was the facilities at the school were inadequate to accommodate parents dropping their kids off. So but that's my understanding. You know, so that raises the question, how would we accommodate them now if we choose to allow it or have a large number of parents transport their kids? Mm -hmm. And, and I do sure. think, if I can add, okay. someone brought it up. I'm sorry, I don't remember who, um, but you're all bringing up wonderful points that are definitely being discussed, um, you know, at the state level. And like I said, with the superintendents and the governor, um, one of them though that I heard was about attendance policy. And that is, I'm glad someone brought that up because I think that is something we're gonna have to look at. The, um, you know, I remember my own kids when they were sick, uh, you know, go to school. Like, you know, you don't feel good, eh, you can go to school. Like if maybe, if maybe you're, you know, you just have the sniffles or, or you're really a little bit tired, but you, you know, buck up, right? And then now we have to think differently about that. If, a, if your child has the sniffles, they're gonna need to stay home. You know, it's, it's the opposite of what we've all been trained and learned to do, that you, you kind of force through and you work hard and you do it. And now if you're not feeling well, you have to stay home. Like that is gonna be the, the process. So that is something else we'll have to think about. So just be a change in mindset. Uh, so we have uh, Lisa and then Murat. Um, so, so yes to all of that. Again, I, I have notes everywhere. Like this is one of the most um, productive and in inline conversations we've had as, school, as, school, as a school committee in a long time. Um, even if we're not agreeing on all the details, we are. I really think that we're all thinking in, in the right direction. Um, two thoughts around the attendance policy and the homeschool policy. At the end of this meeting, um, I'll request those to be on a future agenda item so that we as a school committee can discuss and give direction to Gina and Jane as they are having those meetings as to what um, parameters, right, or how broad or narrow we would be um, willing to support so that they have some thoughts going into that. One example around attendance might be, and, and Jane, you're like right there as I was writing this note, you were talking about it, is, um, in order to encourage families to um, keep children home when they're symptomatic but not sick, right? And you use the example of the sniffles, right? Symptomatic of COVID but not sick enough that you really couldn't go to school and learn. If we're going to require parents to go through the rigmarole of contacting the doctor and getting the doctor's note and going to see the physician, right? But in order to have that as an excuse day, we may unintentionally be encouraging, right? being counterproductive to what we want because that barrier might be so you know too much for parents to do every time a student has a sniffle but if we have an alternative right a, i'm symptomatic but not sick enough to not work but maybe i shouldn't be in school to have an alternative option um i think that's something that we really need to kind of give some some policy teeth to to keep our students in our community safe so again i'll put that on the agenda so that we can really flush each of those topics out and give some guidance um, but while Jen Durkin is here, um, I was hoping that she could address how, in the meantime, um, for our students that are actually immunocompromised, and, and I think, Donna, you were talking about, well, what about the students that um, you know, really can't be around um, in, in this environment right now, or the students, who, the parents who say, well, I'm not going to send my kid to school. Well, that may be personal preference, but if it is actually a matter of disability or a student that's immunocompromised, my understanding is that through their 504 plan, we'll be able to offer them some alternatives. Um, and with Jen here, I thought maybe she could just take a minute or two to explain that that doesn't require a policy, right? That we actually have law that will protect those students if that's the, the, the path that they need to take. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> I've had, actually had several uh, conversations with some parents um, that 
have children that immunocompromised, they're medically fragile, um, both on 504s and IEPs. And those are all individual um, conversations um, with, with parents and um, figuring out what, what they actually need. It's not a global discussion, it's really it's very um, personal and based on their needs and their disabilities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Murat, uh, Donna, and then Linda McAllister. Um, so actually, uh, Lisa asked one of the questions I wanted to ask, and, and that was about the kids who actually are, um, you know, in certain like risk group as far as the COVID is 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 uh, concerned. So their parents may not be willing, you know, I'm not going to repeat everything that Lisa said because I fully agree. So, um, and so my question, then our next follow-up question to that, in addition to us knowing that we do have students induce, you know, higher risk groups, um, did, did, uh, does the school administration plan to poll uh, parents maybe the same way like, you know, we do send um, registration cards every summer saying, you know, you have to uh, kind of pick the bus or whatever. So uh, may, maybe asking parents, do you intend to send your child to school on a regular basis? You know, and maybe describe whatever the limitations will be. Uh, so at least we will know, you know, what is the percentage of the student population that is uh, going to mostly stay home rather than come, you know, come to the school. So if it's 20 students, it's one thing. It's if 20% of the student population, that could be, a, you know, a whole other game as far as the resources go. And Another question that I had also that I kind of came up as far as the, uh, during this discussion is, especially with the kids getting sick in the fall season, I have a feeling that we will have to run maybe not in the full capacity, but the virtual school will have to continue. Because say like for these students who are medically not feeling that they should be going to general population, that's one group, then students whose parents don't feel like going that's too much risk even they feel healthy that's second group and then third group will be kids who may be symptomatic but they're not sure if they're you know carriers or not so that would be a third group so we may end up having a large percentage of the student body that isn't in the school any given day and could be for days and so how are we going to support these people so I have a feeling that we should encourage the physical schooling to resume, but unfortunately, it looks like we will have to continue running the virtual school as well. That, that's just my thoughts. I, I think that's um, the, the reason why the governor is saying, you know, the goal is to nearly have 100% of students return, but then to have those three plans. So it's exactly, I think, in what, what you're talking about. Okay. Okay, we have a lot of people who are, um, who have their hand up. So I've got Donna Chambers and Linda McAllister, Linda Lyle, and then Sheila Grover. Yeah, let me just so add. Donna Chambers. Uh, yeah, let me just add to what Murat has said. I'm gonna ask, add a fourth group. And um, my daughter and her family, as you guys know, she was symptomatic and tested positive. Three of the members, inc and including herself, could not shake the positive test, even though they were totally asymptomatic. And they had to self-quarantine or self-isolate the whole family for a month and a half. And so you've got lots of people, you hear it on the news, people that are asymptomatic but testing very positive and consistently testing positive even though she was getting a test every other day she still had to have two tests before she could go out in the public anyway anyway just another category of concerns thank you thank you linda mcallister yeah just a couple more th concerns um what if a child or a teacher tests positive does that mean then the whole class is quarantined or I'm sure that will come out in the guidelines, but that's going to be another um, 
need to distant learn or, or focus on that some way. And the second part was if teachers are sick, we're going to have to get substitutes for them. So then that would be a new person introduced to this small group. And how are we going to get these substitutes? We already have problems with this. So it's just, and that's a big financial um, implication there. So just two other things that need to be brought to the table. Thank you. Good point. Thanks, Linda. Good point. Uh, Linda Lyle. Um, I actually is feeding off of uh, Tom Pierney's uh, response. Uh, he put a comment in the chat room and I was thinking it myself. Um, I know we our, our business is kids and teaching kids, but you know, we have staff members too. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm sure the administration is thinking about um, working with staff members who might be a little nervous about coming back or um, how they're going to feel, you know, so I think, you know, just having the staff in mind too is important um, when we think about our plan and to have the staff, obviously, I'm sure you're going to have staff members um, included in developing the plans. Um, I'm sure you guys have thought of that. So that's just a, just an idea of thought. Thank you. Thank you. Sheila Grover. Um, I just wanted to mention one more category of people that might be concerned about um, going back to school, and that's kids that have people in their households that are compromised as well. And I think that gets forgotten a lot. Um, it's a pretty scary thing. And I think that the idea of having some sort of tandem, you know, in virtual learning, it, it's it's going to be impossible to do it without having that in some capacity because of all of the many reasons you're all listing now. So I definitely think there's got to be a way to get it all together and I know you'll figure it out. Thank you. And just, Thank just you. As, Linda, okay. as Linda touched on all of these conversations we're having about students that might need to have, it's the same with staff. We might have staff, that are immune, you know, compromised. We might have staff who have someone at home. Um, so it, it, it's it's both groups. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. All right, folks. Um, great discussion. Um, anything further on the reopening? If not, let's move forward. We have uh, I think five more business items to get through. Uh, we have 31 minutes left before a vote would actually have to be taken to extend this meeting past 10 p.m. So. Okay. Next, item H, PPE inventory. This item was requested by George Abbott. It's a list of inventory and items ordered for the start of school, um, and it's included in your packet for the nurse's office. So, so Thanks, Shane. George? I can't hear you, George. Thanks for uh, doing the report. On the surface, it, it, it appears to be wholly inadequate to meet the needs. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I know it does. It's different from the uh, the athletic needs, but uh, in general, you know, the, the number of items listed there is very small. I I know that. Go ahead, Susan. I know. Um, George, this is the list for the nurses. The nurses requested this for their offices. So uh, we do have other items that we're beginning to purchase, or we have been purchasing along, as Jane had said, masks and uh, gloves and other things like that. Thermometers. Also holding back because the state has commented about coming up with a list of what we need and we don't want to spend money on product that they may then turn around and tell us no you can't use that or they may turn around and say we're going to supply that for you mm -hmm. so we the governor's re-entry group has business managers on it it has superintendents on it and they're all working together to try to come up with a bigger list, but the list that I gave you is just for the nurses and their offices. Okay, so when 
when available, could you or your uh, replacement uh, provide us with that information as to what's being ordered and so forth? In a sure, as soon as we get the information and can get started, yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving forward, better I. All right, let her eye. So um, the statewide calendar. So during that same press conference, the governor came out with the statewide calendar uh, for 2021. And as per our contract, um, we always have a meeting with the NEA president first. The superintendent would do that before requesting your approval. The Charahoe calendar has 184 and a half days. The statewide calendar has 180 days. Um, so I wanted to just share with you the statewide calendar and then next a meeting will take place um, with the NEA president and the superintendent um, and then that information will be brought back to you. Um, one other thing, it was clarified on a call I had today that um, it is, this calendar is an executive auditor order from the governor and so it is, it is the law, like the state calendar is, um, comes from the governor's office. So just an information. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Mr. Luzon. I can hear you. Craig, did you have your hand up? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can hear you now. I apologize. Um, I hope this is the only time the state gets involved in school calendars because um, I hate to see it going forward from there. But can you elaborate to me what they mean on June 4th for a tentative date for graduation? Sure. Um, so what they're saying there is that that is, um, it, I have to reorient myself, but I believe if I remember it correctly, that'd be the last day of school for seniors. So the seniors go 170 days. Um, and if the last day of school with this calendar is the 18th, then the last day for seniors would be the fourth. So that's why they have that listed. It doesn't mean it would be the actual graduation ceremony. Okay, because that would be really tough with almost every South County school trying to get in the Ryan Center. Yes. Yes, it would. Um, I'm, and I should point out also on this calendar, it does have eight additional PD days on it, but those days um, are days that the students would still be learning. Um, so, for example, November 16th, um, you'll see them uh, December 14th. So those days in blue that say PD, there are eight of them. Um, there are days that the staff would have PD but the students would still be um, doing distance learning. So it still counts as, counts as part of the students' 180 days. Um, and this calendar also does still start on the same day for students as in our already approved calendar, which was August 31st. So that is very consistent with our current approved calendar for next year that we already had talked about. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Jane on this? Nope. Okay. Moving on to letter J. All right. The CRP. So I recommend approval to submit the consolidated resource plan. It includes our Title I, Title II, Title IV, and IDEA um, federal grants. Mario uh, is available to answer any questions, and the budget pages are included. Um, so, the CRP for a 21, FY21. So moved. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second for approval to submit the CRP. Any discussion? Going once, twice. Okay, uh, no discussion. Discussion's closed. We have a motion and a second to approve a uh, submission of the CRP grant. Those in favor? 
Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Any recusals? Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. Mario. Yes. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Um, this brings us to letter K. I recommend approval per the proposal um, or lower pricing from Dow Financial Services in accord with the terms of the public entity extended terms payment agreement. Um, so this is for, again, the Dell, uh, the Chromebooks finance agreement. And we are working with Dell to try to um, obtain the devices before the start of school. Um, so that's something that Sean and Susan have been working on. We feel we might be able to do that, but we're gonna order them ASAP. But the pricing um, would be the same as in this agreement. So moved. Second. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second to approve the proposal um, at current or lower pricing for Dell Financial Services. Any discussion on this? George? Yes, the interest rate, I believe it's 6.75%. That seems rather high, especially with the uh, overall interest rates nowadays. They could probably borrow money from the government or whomever for uh, much less than that. But I don't know whether I could do anything about it or the school committee, but it just seems high 6.75% in this economic environment in, in, in light of what the Fed is doing with, with interest rates. That, that's all I have to say on that. Thank you, George. Other questions or comments? Oh, and then I'm closing discussion. We're going to move forward with the vote in terms of approving at or lower pricing for Dell Financial Services. Those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstaining or recusals? Thank you. Shenanigans. Okay. I'm sorry, unanimous. I'm sorry. Is that unanimous? Yeah, I didn't see anybody abstain I didn't uh, or vote against. So okay. I'm calling it unanimous. If I got that wrong, please uh, please tell me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cool. The next item is about the Apple computers, uh, the the Macs that we use at the high school. So I recommend approval of the acquisition and financing of computers through a master finance agreement and authorizing the execution and delivery of a master finance agreement equipment schedule and related documents per the attached quote number 2206-286-539 from Apple in accord with terms of the master finance agreement. So moved. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second. Approval of the acquisition and financing of computers through master finance agreement. Any discussion on this topic? I see none. Okay, I'm closing discussion. We'll move forward with the vote. Those in favor of the motion? All right. Thank you. Any opposed? I see none. Any recusals or abstentions? I see none. I'm calling it unanimous. Please correct me if I'm wrong. There we go, it's unanimous. Thank you. Um, this brings us to consent agenda items. I know I, I probably go a little bit too fast on this, I, at least I did last time. Um, does any committee members want anything pulled? Um, speak up, 
if you do, because I don't see any hands and I don't want to miss anybody. Craig Luzon. Uh, I think we need A1 and 2 pulled. And I'd like to pull K1 and K2. A1, A2, K1, K2. So, Chair, at this time, I make a motion to move the remainder. Thank you. I have a motion to move the remainder from Craig and a second from Donna Chambers. Is that correct, Donna? Yes, yes. Yes, thank yes. you. Motion and second to move the remainder. Those in favor? All right. Do I have any opposed? Any abstaining? Any recusals? No. Okay. Then it's unanimous. Um, this brings us to A1. Chair, I make a motion to approve yes, A1 executive session minutes of May 26, 2020, in reference to executive session minutes of May 12, 2020. Second. Thank you. Motion is second to approve A1. Any discussion on this? Okay. Uh, in that case, those in favor of the motion. Thank you. Any abstaining? Opposed? Recusals? Okay, that is a unanimous vote. Uh, Chair, I apologize for pulling yes. the. I did notice somebody was absent during them, so. Nobody was absent, yeah. Oh, uh, at this time I make a motion That's to okay. approve A2 executive session minutes of May 26, 2020, superintendent search update announcements. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? I don't think so, but um, okay. Then we'll move that forward. Those in favor of the motion? All right. Any opposed? Any abstentions or recusals? No, then it's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Brings us to K1. I apologize again, Chair. Um, K1, uh, accept the donation from of Books Our Wings of 400 free books to be distributed with grab-and-go meals. Second. Thank you. Motion and second to accept the donation with gratitude. Um, any discussion? Murat. I know people hate me by now, but for holding this too late. But um, do we know what books will be provided? It's just a list. They say like they're going to be like 400 books or something like that. What are these? They were, um, they were already distributed and they were books. Most of them were actually for younger students, um, first and second graders, small, just books to read. Um, and what we did is we looked at the different families coming for grab and go um and you know gave out what we felt was appropriate by age level and then we left the avail the remaining ones and parents could take them as they wanted but most of them were for younger students okay, younger so, but the school the school administration kind of looked through the list and the school administration distributed them as they so fit yes okay thank you thank you any other questions Nope, then those in favor of motion to accept. Thanks, I think we already did, but yeah. Perfect, any uh, opposed, uh, recusals? Yeah, all right, abstentions. I see none, so I'm calling it unanimous. Please call out if I got that wrong. This brings us to K2. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to accept the K2, the donation from Stephen Tiradio of Wesley, Rhode Island, of a 
white 2001 Ford Ranger valued at $500 to the CTC automotive program. Second. Thank you, motion and a second to accept with gratitude uh, a donation from uh, Stephen uh, Giardio. Any discussion on this? I see none. All right, those in favor of the motion? All right. Thank you. Any opposed abstentions or recusals? I see none. If I've got that wrong, haul her out. Otherwise, I'm calling it unanimous. Good job, folks. This brings us to reports. Okay, um, for a subcommittee reports, I have the necessity for school construction committee met on Ju June 11, 2020. Attached are their approved minutes for their meeting on May 28, 2020. And then for the interim superintendent's report, um, for grab and go meals, um, unless federal funds are available as of right now, the district, we will have to end our distribution of those meals on June 17, 2020. Um, right now, um, we are able to get funds for those meals, but again, as when we did this agenda, and I know things consistently change, um, federal funds are not available. For end of year activities, um, I just wanted to give you an update on some of the things that have been, that are happening this week and last week. So at the middle school, all of the lockers were cleaned out and parents started to pick up items um, last week and they can continue to do that through this Friday. At the elementary schools, they have started to do that um, yesterday and today in terms of coming by the school and picking up items at the high school for grades 9, 10, and 11. That's also happening this week. For many of our fourth graders moving up ceremonies or moving up um, activities are occurring tomorrow. And we just had the Elementary Poetry Out Loud event last evening. Um, and in all of our classrooms, you know, I know that over the last week or two that our teachers have really tried and are doing as much as they can to provide for the students um, social emotional uh, concerns in terms of how to close out school, how to say goodbye at the end of this year. Specifically, it's difficult and we all know that and they're all trying is to be creative and do different things um, to be able to make it fun for students. Um, and tomorrow is the last day of school for the 2019-2020 school year. And um, that's all I have. Thanks, Jane. That's 9.49. Hey, we, uh, all I had to do was threaten the 10 o'clock vote and uh, <laughs> things accelerated. Uh, Mr. Stahl. Uh, really quick, because Jane just reminded me of it, just want to give a public thank you to um, Ashaway Elementary teachers, anyway, um, that are uh, that my kids have as teachers, um, have made the uh, rounds for home visits, um, just to bring some things to the kids and kind of have a face-to-face, -face, driving around house to house. That takes a long time in our school district um, and isn't easy. So. Uh, some did that last week and the last uh, visit is happening with the second grade teacher, Mrs. Pierce, tomorrow. And I uh, just want to thank them for doing that. It's that whole connection thing at the end of the year, saying goodbye thing that uh, Jane was just talking about. So that's uh, above and beyond and uh, not easy to do. So I just wanted to thank them for that publicly. Thanks, Tim. Mr. Luzon. Uh, this is in preparation for the next agenda items, Chair. Okay, uh, then we are at the school committee request for future agenda items or legal opinions, Mr. Luzon. Uh, as much as I enjoy sitting here barefoot and in my shorts, um, I would like to maybe on the July 21st meeting, if the General Assembly can meet in person, I'd like to see you folks in person again. If there's anything we can do about that, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, sir. 
any other school committee requests uh, for future agenda items? I see Lisa and Bill. So Lisa. Um, so in-person meetings would, would be, should still be optional, um, at least for the time being. Um, I, I won't be coming to, to Canvas. Um, but the policy attendance, I think if we um, look at the attendance policy, um, Chair, I think that'll be broad enough to discuss all the notes I made between um, just about every school committee member had some really good thoughts on virtual options. Um, but if that's not broad enough, we can also look at the homeschool policy and virtual alter alternatives. Like, so those are three categories that I don't know how many, how broad that needs to be so that we can have an open and thoughtful discussion laterally across all of those things and still follow open meetings. So attendance policy, homeschool or virtual alternatives ish. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Bill Day. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm a little concerned that we're not gonna be meeting for five weeks. Uh, I think that we need to have an executive session with our new superintendent and in person. Uh, Fifteen people yep. easily meet in the uh, library, uh, and uh, I just think that uh, the sooner the better. Uh, we were very impressed. Most of us were very impressed with Gina, and but I think it's time that we we have a sit down and and and, and talk with 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 the with the young lady and, and find out uh, again uh, where we're going. Uh, and we're all on the same page because uh, I, I had about a two minute, a three minute conversation uh, at the uh, graduation parade. I don't know with any, how many other school community members had an opportunity to say hi to her, but uh, uh, fortunately she, she remembered me. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think it's a face to face yep. it would, be, uh, would be something that we should be doing sooner than not later. Yeah, to that end, Bill, I, I, I totally agree. I think the school committee needs to give Gina a couple uh, weeks to uh, get settled. But I also think so. I was, um, had been talking with Donna Siskavich, and we'll pull the committee members for an appropriate time to hold in uh, a special executive session to discuss uh, job performance uh, specifically uh, related to um, Gina Picard. So you should see something from uh, Donna on that in terms of polling for time, but I would like to have it um, uh, soon uh, after the uh, um, July 4th holiday. Thank you. You're welcome. I have Linda Lyle and then Donna Chambers. Um, just, to, just to piggyback on what Lisa was saying, um, and maybe we could, I don't know if this is too much work for Jane and Gina and your staff, but maybe looking at all the policies that might apply to this. I mean, it could be, I mean, I'm just thinking on the top of, you know, just off the top of my head, anything with uh, grading, use of, I know attendance was one of them, but just any of the policies that might be impacted um, by um, what we do decide to do in the fall when school opens. Okay. Um, so, Linda, just so I'm clear, you want I guess to... A, I guess a general policy review, not just... I mean, I think, Lisa, those are great ideas, and that's a good place okay. to start, but I think there's going to be... And maybe that's just something we do step by step. Maybe we could do it in small groups and not so much, you know, like, you know, like Gina's idea of having a policy review or subcommittees or something that, that might be a good time. Yeah. To do, that. Yeah. Do, do you think uh, an initial overview of like like you said a general policy review but of those policies that uh, the administration know are going to be um, you know significantly impacted and that as a committee will need to address and that's a starting point for us to become aware of it or are you looking for that next meeting where we are not just made aware of it but we are no, the first one. Discussing it. First one, just the first. first one. Okay, so yeah, just the first one. Then just, we a, just a review, so we we tee up what's what's right. going to be addressed if the state hasn't given guidance or so. Okay, understood. Um, Donna Chambers. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> let me just again publicly thank Jane for being interim and in guiding us through this very, 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 very difficult time. 
um, as she passes the baton to Gina and welcome Gina because it's all yours now. Um, and um, I'm sure Jean, uh, Jane will continue to support you as well. Um, and also Mario, I think that you stepped in to the, you stepped up to the plate at a time when we really needed you and thank you. And again, I'm gonna say thank you and good luck with whatever you do from this point on. I'm sure that you'll do good things. Thank you. Thank you. And Sue, you're gonna stick around. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any further requests for future agenda items or legal opinions? Me, me, me. Uh, Murat. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to ask Jane and Gina now uh, that um, they provide some sort of kind of, uh, you know, reach in program or, or a plan, not program. How are you going to reach out to parents and ask them, you know, if they intend to send their kids to school come come fall? Because the next meeting will be, you know, probably end of July, whatever, mid July. So we're going to have, you know, much less time to act on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And David, I saw your hand pop up and it disappeared on my screen, so I wasn't. Uh... I wasn't ignoring you. So, Mr. Stahl, you have the floor. Yeah, no worries there. I I, I was trying to not um, drag us to ten o'clock, but I don't know if we can if we can do it without putting the words on. So let me just say I, I was hearing what Lisa was saying and what Linda was saying, and I'm thinking of a, a temporary pandemic policy that sort of trumps a lot of our other policies just temporarily. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of how the governor uses executive orders during this season. So I think what I was hearing both of them say is, can we have a pandemic policy that, that understands that it's temporary, that we adopt for a time and it may override or trump our other policies for a period of time. I think that's what we're trying to work toward. And so I just wanted to, if we need to have that language of pandemic policy in order to, to talk about it that way, I'd like to put that on there. Uh, yes. Thank you. So you can make mine that. that. That makes sense. That's broad enough. Perfect. Um, anyone else before I, we've got a minute. So all right, I don't see any other hands. Uh, thank you all. It was a long night, but you got a lot of good work done. So Mr. Yeah. Luzon. Here I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. We have a motion to, from Craig and a second from Donna Chambers. Those in favor of adjournment. Aye. Thank you all. Adjournment passes. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. All right. Stay safe. Bye, Donna. Everybody be safe. Bye. Bye.